You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the sixth part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Midoriya was a mixed bag of emotions as he resumed classes on Monday. On the one hand, he was extremely uncomfortable from all the pointing fingers, stares and whispers on his way to class everyone had heard the news that he, Todoroki and Ida had been attacked by the hero killer, and as far as the public was concerned, they had witnessed Stain's defeat. There were a few people who knew the truth, however, after getting a promise from their friends to never share that truth, Midoriya, Todoroki and Ida took turns recounting how the fight really happened. There was no small amount of awe in their friends' faces, though Yuraraka started shaking Midoriya again for being so selflessly stupid, as she put it. Because of that, however, their five friends were unwavering in their support, and that gave Midoriya in particular the strength to walk into class with his head held high. He was even able to look his other classmates in the eye when they asked him questions. Hey, Midoriya, are you guys okay? Minda asked as they all filtered into the classroom. Kaminari stood behind the tiny boy. Yeah, you guys had a run-in with the hero killer. And also the League of Villains tried to kidnap you, Midoriya. While no one had seen the fight with Stain, more than a few people had managed to record the flying Namu as it snatched up Midoriya. The police had already taken his statement, so he just repeated what he told them. I think Shigaraki is still mad because I beat that Namu at the USJ, he said. He seems like the kind of guy who holds a grudge. Thankfully, everyone was okay in the end, right? Yeyurazu cut in, while giving Kaminari and Maito a warning look. Yeah, Hawk saved me before too much happened, Midoriya said, and then made sure to add in the untrue part of the story. An endeavor beat Stain after a couple of minutes. Come on, you have to know more details than that, Kaminari pleaded, only for Gyro to jab him in the side with one of her jacks. Oh, leave the vice prez alone, she said, and then dragged Kaminari away by the ear. Mind to watch them go, then huffed and glared daggers at Midoriya. It's not fair. What isn't? How come you get treated nice by all the girls? Minda asked. You didn't even have to do anything. He saved my life during the entrance exam, Yuraraka commented with a blush. He saved us in the shipwreck zone, Asui reminded him. He's nice to pretty much everyone, Ashido chimed in, though she didn't count Bakugo. Yeyurazu gave Minda the darkest glare she could. And unlike some people, he is respectful. Minda scoffed. Sounds boring. Todoroki stretched and accidentally created a piece of ice that fell down the back of Minda's shirt. Ah, uh, what the hell, Todoroki? Please don't try to corrupt Midoriya. You won't like the consequences. Seeing that most of the strongest students in class were telling him off, Minda finally gave up and headed back to his seat. Not that Midoriya noticed. At that point, he had buried his face in his arms and tried to hide his blush. Thankfully, there was a new distraction in the form of Bakugo more specifically, his hair. For the first time in his life, it wasn't spiky or messy, instead, it was neatly brushed. And if not for the expression of absolute fury on his face, Midoriya would have been hard-pressed to recognize him at all. While Midoriya just stared, the rest of the class stared and then laughed. The vein pulsing on Bakugo's forehead started to turn an alarming shade of purple. Shut up, he snarled. S sorry, man, Kirishima wheezed. Well, and no, I'm not sorry, it's too funny. That stupid agency brushed my hair so much that it got stuck like this. Bakugo let out a muffled scream somehow. His own rage forced his hair back into its usual spikiness. Finally, F, all right, that's enough, Aizawa said as he shuffled into the classroom. Internships are over, so it's back to your normal schedules. He waited about three seconds to make sure that, yes, everyone was seated and paying attention. First off, hand in the homework you were assigned. If you didn't complete it or didn't do well enough, it might impact whether or not you'll be allowed to take further internships or work studies this year. Some of the students looked worried as they handed in the work, including Ishido, until she caught Yeyarazu's eye, and the other girl gave her an encouraging nod. She had gone over her friend's homework at the last second, and was positive that they had all done well enough to at least pass. Speaking of normal schedules, we've got a new kind of lesson for you today during heroics, Aizawa continued. 
before that Yeyarazu, Hagakure. He looked both girls in the eye or at least the general area of Hagakure's head. Before heroics, stop by the support department, they have something to offer for your costumes. There was a quiet gasp from Hagakure, and Yeyarazu looked intrigued. Her experience with Ryuku had made her aware that, while she wasn't badly affected by negative reactions to her current outfit, a more modest costume if that was indeed on the table might be good for her image. But that's for later, Aizawa went on. For now, let's get started. Class went by as normal, but there was a short break before heroics. Yeyarazu walked quickly to the support department, followed by Hagakure, who chatted excitedly. I've been hoping for a costume that I could actually wear for so long, the invisible girl said. I mean, I figured I'd have to wait until they could manufacture a suit from my hair, but that would take forever, especially since I keep my hair short. Yeyarazu glanced at her or, well, her floating uniform that presumably had her in it. How short do you keep it? Around your Uraka's length, but it's kinda hard to say exactly, even for me. Hagakure sighed. It sucks that I can't see my own hair, but at least I can go to school with a bad hair day, and no one will notice. Considering how much time Yeyarazu could spend on her own hair, she envied her classmate a little. I hope your costume works, but I'm still not sure what they are offering me. Self-repairing cloth is generally very thin, and I don't think I'm daring enough to wear something like Midnight Sensei's costume and then you'd be stared at even more by Maita. Hagakure made a gagging sound. Another good thing about being invisible. The conversation drifted over to the internships. Hagakure was a little reluctant to go into detail, but that was because she'd had to perform close surveillance of the leader of a small gang, which had ended up with her watching him in the shower. I mean, he was hot, but still Hagakure's uniform ruffled, and Yeyarazu realized she'd shuddered. Thankfully, they reached the support department before Hagakure had to relive anything more traumatic. They opened the door, and Yeyurazu ducked as something whizzed through the area that had once been occupied by her head. From the way the object dug a crater on the far wall, she was glad she'd ducked. Damn it, Hatsum. What did I tell you about loading that thing before we moved it to the testing area? Sorry, power loader sensei. A familiar voice called back. I thought I saw an error in the calibrations, so I thought I'd test fire with a smaller object. We weren't even supposed to test it today. Power loader. A skinny man wearing jeans and enormous gloves and what looked like pieces of construction equipment on his arms and head noticed that the door was open. Please tell me no one got hurt. I'm fine. Hagakure said cheerfully. I'm not hurt, but I think I need to sit down. Yeyorazu admitted shakily, and her classmate helped her to a chair. But she had barely sat down when Hatsum was suddenly in her personal space, and she jumped back. Hatsum was covered in oil stains, and she hefted what looked like an oversized air cannon over her shoulders. Hey, you're the two who are testing my new babies. She grinned madly. Well, technically they're both the same baby, just modified differently. Hatsum, please let me explain, Power Loader said. Just get the stuff ready, okay? Sure thing. She means well, Power Loader said as the girl ran off, but she's a bit. We understand, Yeyorazu said. We all saw her during the sports festival. Oh, good, that means I don't have to explain. Power Loader cleared his throat. Anyway, you were called here because of changes to your costumes. Can't change what you don't have, Hagakure muttered petulantly. Right, sorry. So, you both requested certain attributes for your costumes that we just couldn't apply at first. Thankfully, Hatsum had a breakthrough. Yes, I did. Hatsum said proudly as she burst into the room with two metal briefcases. Well, technically, I was inspired by that boy who won the sports festival. His watch gave me all kinds of neat ideas for adaptive technology. Hagakure leaned over to whisper to Yeyarazu. If Midoriya is the reason I'm getting an actual costume, I will fight Yuraraka if it means I can kiss him. Let's start with you, Hagakure-san. Power Loader took one of the cases and opened it up. Inside was a pair of pants, slipper-like boots, and what looked like a thin jacket. Each article of clothing was made of a shimmering, silvery material. Before I explain, I'd like you to try these on. There's a changing room in the back. When you're done, there's a button on the inside of the collar. Press it twice, then hold it down for five seconds. Okay. Hagakure dashed off and returned a few moments later. The clothes clung to her tightly, but not so much that she didn't have freedom of movement. A sleeve reached up and tugged at the collar. After about 15 seconds, the arm came back down. It's still visible. Just give it a sec, Power Loader said. 
it's reading your skin cells and adjusting accordingly. As if on cue, the clothes flashed through several different spectrums of light, and then became as invisible as their wearer. Oh, Hagakir was quiet, and she sounded almost on the verge of tears. Oh, yep. Hatsum held her arm out in front of her until she found Hagakir's shoulder. It's woven nanotechnology, with each nanite in your outfit programmed to match the frequency of your body. You can also make it visible again by repeating the process with the button. Oh, and it also insulates against heat and cold, not fire or ice, but you'll be comfortable in all seasons. Hagakure sniffed, and then moved, from the way Hatsum suddenly leaned, and the imprints on her clothes, Hagakure was hugging her. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hatsum beamed. I'll give you the technical specs later, but the short version is that you've now got an invisible suit. And now for you, Yeyorazu-san. Power Loader held out the other case. It wasn't in your initial request, but I received a report from the USJ that your quirk destroyed your first costume, and you had to make a new one. Correct. Yeyorazu nodded. Only Jaira would have known about that, so even if she and Midoriya were only partially responsible for her new costume, she was giving both of them a big hug. Obviously, that affects your lipid count, so this is both for practicality and decency. Power Loader opened the case and pulled out a bodysuit that was the same color as her previous costume. Instead of a yellow belt across the chest, there was a small yellow knob at the base of the throat. Go and try it on, and then we'll test the special features. Yeyorazu went into the changing room and slipped on the costume. It was snug, and the mirror inside the room gave it a look that suggested she'd been poured into the suit. A pair of boots had also been provided, but other than the soles, they seemed to be made of the same material as the rest of the costume. There were no sleeves, but she wondered how she would use her quirk through her legs without destroying the lower half, not to mention anything she made from her torso. Looking good, Yamomo. Hagakure cheered, her outfit visible once again so that everyone knew where she was. Okay, so first, you're going to activate the security feature for the nanotech in your costume, Power Loader said. Hold one finger against the yellow part and start talking for about 20 seconds. Part of this is voice activated, because there was no way to fit in all the commands into the nanotech itself, and this way, it won't fall into the wrong hands. Yeyorazu held her right forefinger to the knob and started reciting all the elements of the periodic table. After she was done, the knob pulsed with light for a moment. Great. Hatsum was bouncing in excitement. Now, use your quirk. Doesn't matter what you make, just so long as it tears the fabric. You want me to destroy part of the costume? Hatsum grinned. Yep. After seeing Power Loader nod, Yeyorazu humored them and created a metal pole from her thigh. The pole burst through the fabric and fell to the ground with a clang. But Yeyorazu hardly noticed. She was busy staring at the hole in her costume, which sealed up and vanished as if it had never been there. The nanotech is programmed to reconnect if it's separated out of its pre-programmed shape. Power Loader explained. You can even hold parts that were completely removed to the rest, and it'll break it down and redistribute it. Yeyorazu was impressed, nanotech had been created decades ago, but interest in the technology had fallen to the wayside with the advent of quirks. Most scientific breakthroughs focused on quirk-related functions. It was theorized that, had quirks not manifested, humans would have colonized the moon, and maybe even farther by now. Thank you so much, she said, and bowed. Wait, there's more. Hatsum held out a silver bracer that went halfway up Yeyorazu's forearm. On one side was a blank screen. You use that book to figure things out, right? Ugh, that's so old-fashioned. This is a modified tablet that can bring up the molecular composition of almost anything. The internet is a great tool, isn't it? There are a few things you won't be able to look up, Power Loader added. We don't exactly want you to start building missiles or nerve gas. He shrugged when Yeyorazu looked hurt. I don't think you would, of course, but better to not have the temptation, or have such information fall into the wrong hands. This tech is pretty cutting edge, after all. I understand. Oh, and there's one other thing. Hatsum turned on the bracer and pressed a few buttons on the touch screen. There was a slight itch as the leggings on Yeyorazu's new costume retracted up to her upper thigh. Tada, summer edition. She pressed another button, and the leggings returned to normal, and the entire costume started to warm up. Winter edition, and everything in between. You can even use this to program designs in the nanotech for fashion purposes. Yeyorazu was amazed. She could admit that she was far above average when it came to intelligence, but Hatsum's designs were beyond anything she could have imagined. Still, it feels like something is missing. Excuse me, is my old costume still available? She asked. There's something I'd like to keep. Sure, no problem. Power Loader handed her a form. Just jot it down so the school knows. Yeyorazu did so, and then accepted the bracer from Hatsum and put it on her left arm. 
she looked down at her new costume, and an idea came to mind. I can change the design. Ha. Huh. Ruku might have inspired me to be more modest, but that doesn't mean I can't be a little daring. By the time heroics rolled around, most of class 1 was starting to get worried when two of their number wasn't with them to get into their costumes. I hope there wasn't a problem, Midoriya said as he put on his new visor, which earned appreciative looks from many of his classmates. Some of them had seen the picture he'd taken with Hawks, but it was another thing altogether to see it in person. He looks cute without it, and cool with it, Yuraraka thought, and then remembered to respond to his comment. I'm sure they're fine, she said. Even if there's a problem, they could just go back to their old stuff. Hey, my old stuff was just gloves and boots. Everyone jumped when they heard Hagakure's voice, and then jumped again when her costume shimmered into existence. Well, that's cool, Ashido said. They finally got you a costume. Yeah, isn't it great? Hagakure spun in place to show them the outfit. Yeah, Momo should be here in a minute. She's fiddling with some stuff. I'm here. Yeyurazu called out as she jogged over. I'm not late, am I? For a moment, no one reacted. They were too busy staring. Yeyurazu's costume was far more modest than her previous one, but the way it hugged her figure left little to the imagination. There was only one reminder of how revealing her last costume was, an open circle that exposed a small amount of cleavage. She had also retained her yellow belt skirt, minus the shelf that had held her book. Damn, Yamomo, Gyro commented. How did you get hotter with more on? Minda opened his mouth to say something, but Dark Shadow emerged from Takoyami and put his hand on the small boy's face. Yeyurazu blushed. Th thank you, Gyro-chan, but we should probably head to class before we're late. Yuraraka noticed that Midoriya was staring at the class president and was a little red-faced. Fighting to keep her jealousy from showing, she gently grabbed his arm and tugged him along. Come on, Deku-kun, this lesson is being taught by All Might. Midoriya nodded and finally regained his composure. He was a teenage boy, so sue him. All Might was as bombastic as ever, laughing with good cheer as the students arrived. You all look raring to go. And young Hagakure, it's nice to see that you've got a real costume. Hagakure bounced in place as she waved at him. I hope you learned a great deal during your internships, because today's lesson is a bit of a curveball. Sometimes, during a crisis, you won't be able to tell the difference between a terrified civilian and a criminal who's only acting. Only the daring, or the foolish, stand there and laugh at their handiwork. The most dangerous of them will be long gone by the time heroes arrive on the scene, and some of them will have never been there in person. Most cases, however, you'll see them pushing away from the crowd. In this lesson, your goal will be to apprehend the villain, while also making sure not to harm the civilians. Each of you will take turns as the hero and the villain, while everyone else will be the civilians. Think of it like a game of tag. You only need to touch the villain in order to capture them. But, there's a catch. The hero won't know which of you is the villain. The villain will get away if he or she can successfully avoid identification for five minutes, or make it to the evacuation area before being captured. Quirks are allowed, but only for the purposes of evasion or pursuit that means no attacking each other. Young Midoriya, you'll be the first hero. Please wait on the other side of the area until you hear the buzzer. Midoriya nodded, and then jogged off. The test grounds for today. Ground Gamma simulated an industrial center, with pipes and circular structures forming a natural maze. For anyone with limited mobility, it was a nightmare. Thankfully, Midoriya could fly if he needed to. He was thankful of his aerial practice with hawks, because as soon as the buzzer sounded, followed by a cloud of smoke, he transformed into jet ray and flew into the air in a perfect takeoff. However, a thought came to him, and he turned into Ghost Freak halfway to his destination and became invisible. He arrived at the disaster site, which was a crater in the ground to simulate an explosion. Most of his classmates were pretending to be panicked civilians, but either put no effort into it, or turned it into a joke by overselling it. Come on, be observant, Ghost Freak told himself. Which of them is acting weird, or trying too hard to be casual? It turned out to be easier than he thought. Ashido kept looking around, trying, and utterly failing to keep from giggling. She also kept glancing at the escape zone, as if waiting for a chance to run for it. Ghost Freak quietly flew behind her and tapped her shoulder. She turned around just as he became visible again. Boo. Ashido shrieked and jumped back. She instinctively hurled a glob of acid at him, but he turned intangible at the last second. Damn it, Midori. She shouted. You almost gave me a heart attack. Sorry, Midoriya said as he turned back to normal. And it was all for nothing, Shoji commented. One of his tentacle mouths curled up in a smile. Asui has almost escaped. Midoriya whirled. Sure enough, Asui was hopping as fast as she could towards the exit. By the time Midoriya activated the Ultimatrix, Asui had escaped. 
Damn it, Midoriya said and slumped. I thought Ishida was the villain. Ashido patted him on the shoulder. Nope, I guess I'm just bad at acting casual. Siro laughed. Yeah, between Su, Todoroki, Takoyami and Shoji, they're the best at being unreadable. You got some bad luck there, dude. It was more than bad luck, young Siro, All Might said as he rejoined them. Young Midoriya, that ghost freak form was perfectly silent and completely invisible. You had more than enough time to observe the crowd and give you a better idea of who the villain was. However, your reaction time was much better. Now, you just need to find a balance between that and your analytical mind. You're right, All Might Sensei, Midoriya admitted. Maybe there were some disadvantages to Hawk's strategy of doing everything as quickly as possible. Hey, Hagakure Sam, do you think you could give me some pointers about being invisible? Hagakure raised one arm, but her hand was still invisible. Still, Midoriya got the feeling she was giving him a thumbs up. No problem. It warms this old man's heart to see you students helping each other. All Might let out a hearty laugh. All right, let's move on to the next match. The rest of the lesson went by smoothly. Ashido and Yuraraka had been unable to discern who the villain of their rounds were both were unlucky enough to have Shoji and Todoroki respectively but when it was their turns to be the villains. Each of the rising stars were able to either fool their opponent or get away. Siro managed to bluff his way through Kaminari, and even deflected his suspicions towards Takoyami for a while. By the time Kaminari had realized he'd been tricked, Siro was home free. When he was the hero, he simply overshot with his tape, and then reeled himself into Tag Maita. Though she'd had less success for the hero part of the lesson, Yuraraka had done better as the villain. She had simply used her quirk on herself and propelled forward in a gravity-removed arc, far outside of Gyro's reach. She then cancelled and reapplied her quirk several times to safely lower herself to the exit. The best part was that she was only a little nauseous after landing. Ashido had had the easiest escape, and also the most motivation. Her opponent had been Minta, Ashido had just sprinted ahead of him. Iyarazu had also made a break for it. But with Takoyami in dark shadow right behind her, she created a trail of flashbangs from her back and everyone noticed that her new costume repaired itself as soon as it was damaged that disoriented the former and disabled the latter. When she was the hero, she used the same quick drying cement she'd utilized against Bakugo to literally stop Kirishima in his tracks. After escaping Midoriya as the villain, Asui had equal success as the hero. Ayama had managed to evade her attempts at capture at first but he overdid it with his naval laser and fell to his knees. He was still clutching his stomach when Asui tagged him, which turned into a sympathetic pat on the back. Todoroki had easily blocked off Sato's escape with a wall of ice, but his friends were pleased to note that he wasn't so emotionless about it. He even made awkward small talk with Sato as they rejoined the class. Ida had very nearly lost both his attempts, but a last-second recipro burst had got him close enough to tag Kaminari. When it was his turn to be the villain, and he saw that his opponent was Hagakure, he didn't hesitate to book it with a recipro extend. That had also easily netted him the record for fastest escape. When it was his turn to be the villain, Midoriya just waited until Kirishima got close, then turned back into Ghost Freak and simply floated to the exit. He didn't even turn invisible, just intangible so that Kirishima was unable to tag him. After that, the lesson was over, and the students were dismissed to the locker room to get changed. As Midoriya pulled off his hoodie, Kaminari walked up to him. Hey, Midoriya, can I ask you a question about today's lesson? As sure, what's up? Kaminari shrugged. How come you didn't try to bluff your way past Kirishima? No offense, he quickly added to the redhead. It's just that you're not exactly the suspecting type. Midoriya sighed. I'm in not exactly good at K keeping my calm. I thought I'd have better luck just escaping. And you did great, Kirishima praised. That ghost freak form of yours makes it impossible to catch you. Kinda wish we could have had a manly battle to see if we could escape. Though, I want another go at you and your forearms. Uh, actually, I have another form that might be good for S strengthening Y your quirk. Midoriya said, looking down at the Ultimatrix. It's good for a straight up brawl, and Y you might be the only P person in our class who can take a hit from him. At first, Kirishima grinned in excitement, but then he saw that Midoriya was more nervous than usual. What's wrong with that one? Er, Midoriya glanced at Ben, who knew which alien he was thinking about and was laughing. I get really angry when I use him. And kind of stupid, Sato chuckled as he put on his shirt. Sounds like me when I use my quirk. Across the room, Bakugo pretended not to listen to Midoriya, but he was actually paying close attention. Some of his forms change his personality, ha, huh? of the male part of class 1A. Only one student was genuinely not paying attention to the conversation. Instead, he was focused on his own discovery. Just mind to wave to get the boy's attention. Guys, you'll never guess what I found. 
your sense of common decency. Todoroki asked blandly. Mine to leered. Never gonna happen. No, see this poster. He pointed to the poster in question. See, behind this poster is a hole. Do you know what's on the other side of this hole? From the look on Minta's face, Midoriya suspected he wouldn't like the answer. It's the girl's locker room. Minta grinned lecherously. Someone must have drilled a hole to peek in on the ladies. It's the jackpot. The other male students looked at him with disgust, anger, or a combination of both. Even Midoriya was tempted to hurt the smaller boy. How could he be so disrespectful to the girls? They deserve better than to be watched as they took off there. Unbidden, an image of Yuraraka popped into his mind. She was slowly peeling off her costume. Midoriya bit the inside of his cheek as hard as he could to snap out of it. Yes, the girls in his class were attractive, and yes, he might have a crush on Yuraraka, but he would be damned if he sank to mind his level. He shared a glance and a nod with Todoroki and Siro, and the three sprang into action. Siro wrapped up Minta with his tape and dragged him off, while Todoroki put his hand over the hole Minta had discovered and started to fill it with ice. We're really sorry about him. Midoriya shouted before the hole closed up, and he helped Siro drag Minta away. On the other side of the wall, the girls of Wana collectively smiled. They had heard the commotion and Midoriya's apology. Can I just say right now that I'm glad the rest of the boys aren't like Minta? Pagakure huffed as she put her skirt on. How has he not been expelled yet? Yeyurazu scowled and finished putting on her own clothes. Because he's very good at not crossing that line, especially in front of a teacher. If he ever does that, and we provide evidence, he'll be gone in a heartbeat. Ashido leaned down to the hole in the wall, now plugged with ice. Darn it, I was kinda hoping to get a look at the boys. She grinned at the looks the other girls were giving her. What? Even if they weren't ripped before, all the exercise we do is getting them shredded. While Yeyorazu berated her pink friend, Yuraraka couldn't get Ashido's words out of her head. The image of Midoriya without a shirt kept popping up, with the muscles of a Greek god. The worst part was that he kept himself hidden with loose clothes, so for all she knew, he was that chiseled. That's not fair, she thought, he can't be cute and hot at the same time. Asui tapped her on the shoulder. Achako, are you okay? Yuraraka jumped. Why yeah, I'm fine, totally fine. Why would you ask if I wasn't fine? I'm completely fine. Asui gave her a flat stare. Her gaze flitted to Ashido, and then the iced over hole. Sure you are, Ribbit. Looks like school's over. Yep. Can we grab him now? Not yet. He's saying goodbye to his friends. We'll take him when he gets home. His mom is at work right now. Good. Let's get this done. Midoriya was in a good mood as he got home. Though he hadn't gotten the highest score in heroics, he definitely hadn't done the worst. And he had learned plenty. Now he just needed to get his homework done. And then he could spend the rest of the evening messaging his friends and finish reading an interesting article on the first generation of pro heroes. He'd already read it twice, but it was still an enjoyable read, and it was more for Ben's sake than his own. He had barely touched the door when hand covered in a black glove grabbed his wrist. Sorry, kid, an unfamiliar voice said. We need to talk. Let's go somewhere private. Everything became a blur as Midoriya was pulled away from his home at incredible speeds. When the world came back into focus, he recognized the heaps of trash. He'd been taken to Dagaba Beach in less than two seconds. As his brain caught up with him, he looked up into the face of his kidnapper. He didn't recognize him, but he didn't look Japanese. He was at least six inches taller than Midoriya, with messy blonde hair. He wore a green knee-length coat with black flame designs on the hem and ends of the sleeves. Over a black shirt, he also wore dark green pants and black boots. But it was his face that really got Midoriya's attention. His eyes were a cold gray and his hair was the wrong color, but he looked almost exactly like the Ben he knew, albeit a few years older. WH who are you? Midoriya asked. What do you want with me? Like I said, we need to talk. The man finally released his iron grip and took a step back. We just needed some privacy. WE. The air shimmered, and then a girl appeared next to him. Yeah, you really need to pay attention, kid. To be fair, you are invisible, the man pointed out. That's his problem, not mine. While they bantered, Midoriya got a look at the girl. She couldn't have been more than a few years older than him. With shoulder-length brown hair and blue eyes, she was around Midoriya's height, but living in a world of quirks meant that Midoriya couldn't underestimate her. She wore a dark red bodysuit that had short sleeves. It was accented by a thick blue line up both sides, a dark blue belt around her waist, and an inverted omega on her chest. She also had strange red earrings that looked vaguely familiar. And, much to his shock, she had a red ultimatrix on her left wrist. Other than the color, the only difference between hers and his was that hers had a roughly triangular crest with an S over the dial. You done sizing us up? The man asked him. Sorry, you weren't exactly subtle, 
and you were muttering about half of your observations. Uh, sorry, it's a habit. Midoriya frowned. Wait, why am I apologizing? You kidnapped me. I prefer to calling it borrowing without permission. Can we stop messing around? The girl scowled up at her partner, and then at Midoriya. We're here for the Ultimatrix. Give it to us, and we won't hurt you. The man sighed. Jen, we really need to work on your social skills. Screw my social skills. The girl, Jen, snarled and grabbed the Ultimatrix on Midoriya's arm. Give me the watch. Then, who had been tense at Midoriya's side the whole time, blinked. Aggressive action toward device detected. Activating failsafe. There was a flash of green light. And then the girl was sent stumbling back after four arms punched her in the face. The man face bombed. Okay, I guess we're doing this now. Are you happy, Jen? Actually, I am. Jen grinned at four arms, but there was nothing friendly about it. Now I have excuse to beat you bloody and take that watch. Jen moved. One second, she was 20 feet away. The next, she was right in front of him. Her first punch sent him flying 50 feet into the air. The next connected right before he hit the sand and drove him into a rusted washing machine. Four arms winced, and then gasped as he tried to get air back into his lungs. Four arms was tough, but whoever Jen was, her strength was far beyond what he could take. She has multiple quirks, he thought as he staggered to his feet. Her speed could be a byproduct of her strength, but she could turn invisible. Wait, she has an ultimatrix. Is she from Ben's universe? If that's the case, the rules about quirks might not apply here. I'll have to slow them down so that I can escape and find a pro hero. These two are dangerous, and I need to be safe before I can find answers. He slapped the dial on his chest, and transformed into a humanoid lizard with blue skin and a hunched posture. He wore a dark blue jumpsuit, with the Ultimatrix dial on his chest. Arctic Guana. Oh, great, he's shouting the names, Jen grumbled. The man, who was now sitting on a broken down car, laughed. I think it's cute. You could help me, you know. No, the man said and leaned back. You're doing fine on your own, really. Arctic Guana fired a cryo beam from his mouth, hoping to hit Jen while she was distracted. However, her incredible speed kicked in, and she leaned out of the way. Unfortunately, her relaxed companion was directly behind her, and suddenly found himself trapped in a block of ice. Um, Arctic Guana and Jen glanced at each other and spoke at the same time. Whoops. Jen darted forward and dodged another ice beam, and then drove her knee up into Arctic Guana's chin. He felt a few of his teeth loosen as he flipped through the air and landed in a pile of trash before the concussion set in. He slapped the dial again and turned into swamp fire. Okay, that really hurt, he said as he healed up. Are you trying to kill me? Jen actually looked offended at that. Of course not, but I am taking the ultimatrix. The girl launched herself at him again. Swamp fire brought up his arms to defend himself, only for someone to appear between him and his attacker. There was a muted boom as Jen's fist crashed into her friend's open hand. The shockwave still bowled swamp fire over, but the man was hardly affected. His coat fluttered a little, but that was it. I think you've made your point, he said gently. Can we please try it my way now? He glanced back at Swampfire and then brushed some frost off his shoulder. That was unpleasantly cold, by the way. Jen took a deep breath and then stepped back. Fine, you get one shot. Ken, if he still doesn't give up, I'm taking that watch. If he doesn't give up, I'll take it myself. The man, Ken, glanced back at Swampfire, who was reached for the dial again. No, none of that. Ultimatrix, emergency override, code 10. Ben appeared in front of Swampfire. From the way Ken and Jen blinked, they could see him now. Override recognized. Ben's voice was completely toneless, which unnerved his friend. Initiate shutdown, Ken commanded. Bloodline authorization. Just like that, Ben vanished, and Midoriya turned back to normal. He did a double take between Ken and the Ultimatrix. What did you do to him? Midoriya demanded. Ken raised an eyebrow. Huh, more concerned about the tutorial program than yourself. He shook his head. Not important right now. Unlike certain little sisters I could name, I just want to talk. Jen huffed, but didn't refute anything he said. Had he not been so scared, Midoriya would have paid more attention to the fact that his would-be kidnappers were now speaking English. He could understand the language well enough, but oh, right. He remembered that the Ultimatrix also acted as a translator. Since it was offline, he had to figure out what was being said the hard way. Midoriya backed up until he was touching another wrecked car. WH what do you want to talk about? That watch, for one thing, Ken said, gesturing to the Ultimatrix. See, it holds the key to saving our dad's life. Our dad is the real Ben Tennyson, Jen cut in, not that hologram you've got. We don't really have time for all the details, Ken continued. 
The short version is that our dad is dying, and the only thing that can keep him alive is inside that watch. Midoriya glanced down at the Ultimatrix. Why didn't you just say so? Ken rolled his eyes and lightly flicked his sister's head. See, I told you we could talk it out. Jen scowled at him. Oh, shut up. I have a lot of aggression to work out right now. Anyway, that's why we're here, Ken said. We need the Ultimatrix to save our dad. Now, I'm being nice, but we have three options going forward. Option 1. You hand over the Ultimatrix. We head back home, get dad fixed up, and give you back the watch when we're done. Shouldn't take more than a few hours, maybe a day. Option 2. Jen said as she crossed her arms. We fight you again for the watch. Since you can't use it anymore, that'll be a short fight. We'll take the Ultimatrix, and you'll never see us, or it, ever again. Midoriya gulped. And option 3. Ken smiled. You come with us, and we prove just how badly we need the Ultimatrix. Besides, after Dad's better, I'm sure he'll want to talk to you in person. It's not every day you meet someone who meets the criteria to be worthy of that watch. Also, he'll probably want to thank you. The smile faded. Please, I'm asking for your help. He paused for a moment. Here, a gesture of good faith Ultimatrix. Override, code 10. Reactivate. Reactivation successful, Ben's voice said. Resuming normal functions, Ben flickered into view, blinked, and then turned to Midoriya. What did I miss? Are we still fighting? And no, I don't think so. Midoriya started to reach for the Ultimatrix's dial, but then stopped. They want my help to save the real Ben Tennyson. Ben's only sign of surprise was to blink again. All right, what do you want to do? Midoriya wanted to think about it, but he was honest enough with himself to know what option he'd choose. Someone needed help more than that, someone was asking for help. What kind of hero would he be if he said anything except, Okay, I'll help you. Midoriya looked at Ben, who nodded and vanished, and then at the siblings. Can I at least leave a message for my mom? Ken nodded. Sure thing, kid, I'll deliver it for you. Midoriya tore a page out of a notebook and wrote a short note. Sorry, mom, I'll be late. An emergency came up with Ben. I should be home either late tonight or early tomorrow to explain everything and handed it to Ken. Rather than run off at super speeds, he just snapped his fingers, and the note vanished in a flash of green light. It went right to your kitchen, he said, and then snapped his fingers again, creating a human-sized portal in front of them. You two go on ahead. I'll be right behind you. Jen grabbed Midoriya by the wrist much gentler this time and tugged him towards the portal. Just hurry up, Ken. We don't need any attention drawn to this place, and a portal to another universe will do that. Ken chuckled. Funny, I thought the metahuman brawl on the beach did that. I'm metahuman. Midoriya echoed. Later, okay. Jen pushed him into the portal. And you get. Ken waited for his sister to follow Midoriya. He took a step towards the portal, and then turned around. This has been bothering me all day. He muttered, and snapped his fingers again. When the portal closed, Ken left a pristine beach behind him. Oh, I regret this, Midoriya wheezed. I regret everything. Jen gently rubbed his back with legitimate concern on her face, a far cry from the aggression she'd shown just a few minutes earlier. Sorry, some people don't do well in other universes, she said. Looks like we can go to your universe without any problems, but you can't come to ours without feeling like, ah, uh, like I want to die, Midoriya finished. As soon as he'd stepped through the portal, he'd fallen to his hands and knees, overcome with the worst nausea and dizziness he'd ever felt in his life. Fortunately, he'd been able to hold his lunch in. This isn't fair, you could have warned me. Honestly, we didn't know, Jen said. It's not like we can test this sort of thing beforehand. Ken helped Midoriya to his feet. Don't worry, I'll give you a pick-me-up, it should last long enough. Midoriya watched as Ken put his hand, now glowing green, on his head, a moment later he felt fine. Now that he didn't feel so horrible, he was able to take stock of his surroundings, wherever he was didn't have any windows. But it was a large room, mostly empty, but dotted with computer terminals. Each of them was manned by someone in a purple uniform that only glanced in his direction. There were a few other people milling about, and they were in costumes that just screamed hero to him. You're lucky I've had practice healing people in your universe, Ken said, getting his attention again as he helped him to his feet. It's not a permanent fix, I'm just balancing out your equilibrium so that you don't make a mess on the floor. We just waxed it. It took about two seconds for what he said to click in Midoriya's mind. You're the vigilante who saved Ada's brother. Ken paused. I'm just going to pretend I know who that is. If you're talking about the guy who got stabbed, then yes. Jen gave him a look. That's what you did. I thought you actually did something wrong. Midoriya kept looking from one to the other. I feel like I'm missing something. Also, where are we? A terrifying thought occurred to him. Wait, am I in another universe? Ken laughed. Didn't think this through, did you? No, Midoriya groaned. Ken gently guided him forward. 
Well, we are kind of in a rush, so we'll give you the tour a little later. Come on. They quickly exited the large room and followed a gently curving hallway. This one had a window, and as soon as Midoriya saw what lay beyond it, he froze. There, gently turning below him, was Earth. Are we in space? Jen raised an eyebrow. Yeah, probably should have mentioned that. Welcome to the Watchtower, primary base for the Justice League, temporary base for the Titans. Midoriya had way too much to process at that moment, and if it weren't for Ken keeping a firm grip on his shoulder, he probably would have sat down hard to think. Space travel had lost the public interest over the last few generations on his Earth, and, wow, he just started to realize that he was no longer on his Earth. This is a space station. Yep. Ken shrugged. We don't usually have everyone on either roster here unless there's some serious end-of-the-world stuff happening, so you probably won't see everyone. Actually, there's a crisis in Russia right now that the League is intervening in, and a few of the Titans are in New York, dealing with some smugglers, but they should be back in an hour or two. Seeing Midoriya's confusion, Jen sighed. It's a base for two different superhero teams. We're part of the Titans, and we're just using it until our new base is up and running. Got it. Remembering how Jen was able to beat him senseless without much effort, Midoriya hastily nodded. Got it. Good, because we're almost at the infirmary. Jen glanced at her brother. I'll go on ahead and let them know we've got the Ultimatrix. Sure, sure. Ken kept Midoriya from getting bowled over by the shockwave produced by Jen running at super speed. She's so bad at keeping her cool. It's why we never assigned her undercover work. Midoriya looked up at him in confusion. You said your dad was dying, right? I'm kind of surprised you aren't acting like her. Ken smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. Oh, believe me, I'm about 10 seconds from just ripping that watch off, arm included, and running it to my dad. He chuckled when Midoriya paled. I'm just really good at keeping myself under control. One of the benefits of a lifetime making sure I don't accidentally kill someone. Midoriya didn't say anything else, mostly because he couldn't get the image of his arm being brutally torn from his body out of his mind. After another few minutes of walking, Ken brought him to a set of automated doors, guarded by two people in costumes. One was a blonde-haired man dressed in varying shades of green. He had a bow and a large quiver full of arrows on his back. On the other side of the door was a beautiful woman with long blonde hair. She wore a black jacket over a low-cut outfit, with fishnet stockings and combat boots. Hey, kiddo, the man said cheerfully, though even with the double diamond mask over his eyes, it was easy to see that he was tired. You brought a guest. The woman examined Midoriya with a critical gaze. I hope you didn't just kidnap him. Of course not. Ken grinned. Jen beat him up. I asked for his help, and then I kidnapped him. He then pressed a button on the wall, and the door slid open. I'll introduce you to everyone later, kid. Bewildered, Midoriya followed him through the door, but as soon as he saw what was on the other side, he froze. Thanks to the hologram and the Ultimatrix, Midoriya had had a pretty good idea of what Ben Tennyson looked like. Even as an adult, he wasn't expecting to ever meet him like this, though. He was lying on a bed, eyes closed and too pale to be natural, and even unconscious appeared to be in a great deal of pain. His hair was gray, though his face seemed several decades too young for that. Several different machines were connected to him, some Midoriya recognized from his own recent visit to the hospital, but others were unmistakably alien. His left arm also caught his attention. Ben's Ultimatrix was larger than Midoriya's and colored silver. The opposite hand was held in both hands of a blonde-haired woman that looked almost exactly like Jin, except for the hair. She wore a blue bodysuit with red boots, a short red cape, and a red S mounted over a shield-shaped crest on her chest. That must be Ken and Jen's mother, Midoriya thought. Ben's wife, Jen, who was standing next to her mother with one hand on her shoulder, gently shook her. Mom, he's here. About time. Midoriya jumped when a tiny, hunched figure hopped over to him. He looked like gray matter, only with mustache-like tendrils on his face, and he held himself up with a cane. You could have brought him here hours ago. Ken rolled his eyes. True, but that would have involved infiltrating his school full of metahumans. This was easier. I thought you'd approve of us taking a measured approach, Asmuth. Midoriya started. This was the creator of the Omnitrix. Asmuth huffed. Yes, yes, I'm not what you were expecting, but we don't have time for that song and dance. Ultimatrix. Then, the hologram flickered and appeared in front of everyone, awaiting instruction. Midoriya would be the first to admit that it was creepy to see his friend act so. Robotically, access hardware diagnostics, Asmuth commanded, and a holographic screen appeared in front of him. He gently swiped at his mustache as he read the contents. Hmm, yes, the original template is still embedded in the hardware. I can use this to synthesize a cure, a real cure this time. 
a well-built man with an outfit similar to Ben's wife's, albeit made with a thicker material and a longer cape, raised an eyebrow. You thought you'd saved him the last time. I was trying to stop the poison last time, Asmuth said. I hadn't realized that it had simply become dormant all these years. Now that I know what to look for, I can purge it from Ben's system. Finally, Midoriya couldn't take it any longer. Can somebody please tell me what's going on? Asmuth huffed again. Years ago, the Ultimatrix was destroyed by one of Ben's enemies. What was left was used as a medium to infect him with a virus that was killing him. To make a long story short, I stopped the virus, and we all thought that was that. It turns out that the virus had mutated over the years, until it became strong enough to kill him. The only way for me to create an antidote is with the original strain of the virus, which remained inside the Ultimatrix, which Ben asked to be rebuilt a few years ago. Midoriya didn't know what was more impressive that Asmuth had managed to remain composed throughout his explanation, or that he had been working the whole time he'd been talking. Wait, does that mean I'm infected? Midoriya looked down at the Ultimatrix in worry. What? No, that virus was tailored to attack Ben's specific DNA. Stop worrying. Asmuth held out one tiny hand. I've written the coding. Now I just need to extract a physical sample of the virus. A few molecules should be sufficient. I just need to take the Ultimatrix to my lab for the extraction. Hand it over, boy. Midoriya flinched back. He was ashamed to say that a small part of him didn't want to be parted from the watch. It was what had brought him so close to his dream of being a hero, and had given him the chance to have friends. Now, a complete stranger was asking him to give it up. Ben's wife stood up and walked over to Midoriya unsteadily. Please, we need the Ultimatrix to save him. Oh, who am I kidding? He looked at Ben, still unconscious and in pain. There's no real choice. He held out his arm. Take it. Asmuth pressed a circle on his holographic keyboard, and the Ultimatrix slid off Midoriya's arm. I'll be back as soon as I can. A moment later, he vanished, and Midoriya was left in a room full of strangers. Now, without the Ultimatrix, he felt terribly vulnerable. Thankfully, Ken seemed to pick up on that and gently patted his shoulder. Nothing left to do but wait. Come on, let's get you up to speed. Here you go, Ken said as he slid a drink over to Midoriya. It's a smoothie. Lom told me the best stories of how Dad lobbed to get a smoothie maker installed up here, and then the weird dance he did when it finally happened. Midoriya took a cautious sip and nodded when he tasted strawberry. This is good. Thank you. Treating people to smoothies is a Tennyson thing. Ken chuckled. Well, Dad likes to say that it is. Mom would argue that being stupidly lucky is a Tennyson thing. Speaking of your dad, Midoriya said, is he going to be okay? Ken sighed. I hope so. The smartest guy in three galaxies is working on it, and if necessary, he can call on anyone from the League or the Titans to help him. We've got everything from science to sorcery, plus whatever Amazo has up his golden sleeves. His expression grew flat. I mean, we tried all that to save Dad with all that already, but apparently the poison evolved to be resistant to freaking everything. Midoriya blinked as he tried to process Ken's words. What? Ken nodded. Right, you only have metahuman powers on your Earth. Here, our superheroes cross off all the boxes. We've got everything from humans with powers, robots with powers, people with magic powers, aliens with powers, and people without any powers at all. I was tea talking about the poison that evolved to resist them magic, but... Midoriya latched onto the topic he was most familiar with. Wait, you can be a hero on this Earth without a quirk. Quirks aren't a thing here, remember. Also, we don't do the license thing, so we're all vigilantes. Ken shrugged. Oh, and my girlfriend doesn't have powers, and she's widely regarded as the third scariest human on this earth. Midoriya swallowed nervously. Who are the two above her? I maintain that second place is her dad. But I'm in the minority, the number two spot shifts around, depending on who you ask. Ken looked over Midoriya's shoulder. Here comes the top dog right now, though, or top bat, I should say. Midoriya turned to see a tall man dressed in form-fitting gray body armor, with a long black cape, complete with a pointy-eared cowl that covered the upper half of his face. He had a belt with plenty of compact containers, and on the center of his chest was the silhouette of a bat. He only gave Midoriya a single look, but there was enough intimidation there to send a chill down his spine. Ultiman, he said in a deep, gruff voice, I assume Asmuth has the Ultimatrix and is working on an antidote for Ben. Ken nodded. Somehow, he was completely unaffected by the man locking eyes with him. Yeah, he is, Batman. If he doesn't show up again in an hour, I'll check in on him. Batman didn't react to Ken's words, and instead gave Midoriya another piercing look. Make sure to keep an eye on your guests. The watchtower isn't for tourists. Technically, I didn't invite him, I kidnapped him, Ken said. But Batman had already turned and left, so he shrugged. 
He doesn't show up for days, and that's how he acts. Rude. He's probably worried about dad. That was worried. Midoriya paused. How did he know about everything if he hasn't been around for days? Ken laughed. I'm not surprised he knows. He's Batman. He stopped and tilted his head, as if he was listening for something. Oh, good, they're back. We should be expecting company in about three seconds. Sure enough, Midoriya had barely reached the count of three in his head when several blurs shot into the cafeteria and came to a halt in front of their table. One was a man wearing a black bodysuit that only exposed his mouth and hair and red goggles over his eyes. His costume was decorated with red lines and a red lightning bolt on his chest. Another was a young woman with long black hair and wore a loose white shirt and skirt, along with a short cape. Her costume had gold edges and a gold lightning bolt on her shirt. The last blur was a young man with short black hair. He wore combat pants, boots, and a black shirt with the same S shield that Midoriya had seen on Ben's wife and the man with a similar costume to her. Come to think of it, this younger man looked almost exactly like that man in the infirmary though the black and red ultimatrix on his arm stood out. How many people here have an ultimatrix? Midoriya thought. Ken, you're back. The redhead kept darting between Ken and Midoriya so quickly that it looked like he was in two places at once. Hey, is this the kid who had the old watch? Is everything okay? How's your dad? Ken stood up and managed to catch the man by the shoulders. Zoom, calm down. You're going to create a friction fire again. He looked at the other two. Did someone give him coffee? The other man held up his hands. Hey, we know better. He's just worried. He frowned. We all are. Is Uncle Ben okay? Ken sighed, and then picked up Zoom as easily as Midoriya picked up his smoothie and moved him to the side so that he could speak to the one who was presumably his cousin. Asmuth has the Ultimatrix and is working on the antidote. Until then, we wait. I'm assuming Mgan is still connected to you, so if you could give her the update, I'd appreciate it because I don't want to repeat myself a dozen times. At that point, Midoriya was glad he was sitting down. So much was happening, and he was starting to get dizzy. He just wanted to drink his smoothie, and hoped that everyone just ignored him for a while. He couldn't take that kind of attention from strangers. I wish I had my friends here, he thought. Or at least the Ben I know to tell me it's going to be okay. Oh, man. I hope he isn't mad that I just gave him over to Asmuth without even talking to him about it. Silently worrying as he was, he didn't notice that the woman had sat down next to him until she tapped his shoulder. He would have jumped to his feet in surprise, but she kept a grip on his arm that was much stronger than her appearance suggested. Hey there, she said kindly. Rough day, I'm guessing. Midoriya nodded shakily. I h have no idea w what's happening. The woman laughed and patted his shoulder. Yeah, you got thrown into the deep end. Did Ken steal you right out of your school? Midoriya looked down at his uniform. Uh, and no, I was outside my home. S sorry, I d don't know who any of you are. She smiled at him. And Sergeant Marvel. A guy with way too much energy is Zoom. And Ken's cousin over there is Superboy. We're all part of the Titans, but those three are some of the founding members. Midoriya nodded again. Hero teams, I can understand that. There are two on this space station, the Justice League and the Titans. Maybe I can handle this. Hey, Marvel. Ken glanced at her over his shoulder. Where's your boyfriend? He's one of maybe two people on this earth that Asmuth enjoys spending time with, and he could help with that. Actually, Brainiac called me about 20 minutes ago, Sergeant Marvel said ruefully. He said that he forwarded some analysis to Asmuth some science-why stuff that went over my head but he can't be here now. He's still working on containing the radiation leak in Ireland. At that point, Midoriya felt brave enough to speak. W what's happening in Ireland? Sergeant Marvel smiled at him again. Some terrorists managed to steal an old nuclear submarine and ran it aground on the coast of Ireland. It started leaking radioactive materials, so some of the Titans were sent to contain it, while Captain Adam actually fixes the problem. He absorbs radiation. You guys seem really busy, Midoriya commented. Superboy chuckled. Oh, this is an easy day. Half the league is on standby today, but more times than not, it's a skeleton crew up here. We just got back from busting some drug runners in Florida, which was a nice change of pace. My friend helped catch some drug smugglers a few days ago, Midoriya said, in an effort to actually be part of the conversation. She told me how they were caught. Are the ones you went after on the water, or did they make it ashore? They weren't smugglers from out of the country. Just guys moving their product from one spot to another. Superboy paused and looked off to the side. Looks like everyone else is finally here. Midoriya followed his gaze, but there was no one there. Superboy smirked. Super hearing, they'll be here in a few seconds. More and more people trickled into the cafeteria. Some only stayed for a little while, just to hear that progress was making on saving Ben, while others stuck around. 
Most of the latter, Midoriya noticed, were around Ken's age or younger, and were part of the Titans, while the Justice League's members were all much older, though they didn't look it. When he commented on that, a young woman with green skin, orange hair, a black bodysuit with a red X across the chest and a long blue cape smiled. Oh, that's a long story, she said. The short version is that a spell was cast on the League that affected them and everyone they consider family. It wasn't something we wanted, Superboy chimed in as he sat next to her. Right, anyway, everyone ages one day for every year now. When she saw Midoriya open his mouth to speak, she cut him off. It only affects people when they stop growing. It was all part of an elaborate plot by an immortal who was losing his immortality to steal all the years we all would have gotten, Ken added. It didn't work, and he ended up dying. Midoriya was starting to get overwhelmed again. He could feel his arms and legs losing strength, and he might have even fallen backwards if not for a very large wolf that suddenly filled his vision. Midoriya froze, completely unsure what to do, especially when the wolf put its head in his lap. Superboy smiled proudly. I've been training wolf to be a therapy dog. He's way smarter than most dogs, so he's good at knowing when people need him. Just hold on to him until you're okay. The green girl glanced at everyone else, Midoriya swore her eyes glowed for a second, and then everyone else took a few steps back to give him some space. Th thanks, he mumbled as he scratched the ear of the wolf, who was apparently named Wolf. Sorry, I am not good with strangers, or crowds. You should probably work on that, Ken said, not unkindly. Unless you want to be like Batman and stay in the shadows. You don't seem to be the broody type, though. I did on th think I'm cut out for all black clothes, Midoriya tried to joke. It earned him a few laughs, for which he was thankful. Another woman sat down across from him. She wore a black coat over form-fitting armor and a belt that held several weapons. She also had a silver helmet that completely hid her face, with only a hole in the back to let her black braided hair fall down to her back. Strangely, the helmet was completely blank, so Midoriya had no idea how she saw out of it. So, you're from another universe, she said, and Midoriya was surprised that her voice wasn't muffled in the slightest by her helmet. Ultiman didn't tell us much about it, other than most people have powers on your earth. What's it like over there? The woman paused. I'm Seeker, by the way. Don't mind the questions, Ken said. She likes to know things. Seeker nodded. Speaking of knowing things, where's Asmuth? As if on cue, Jen rushed in in a blur. He's back. Come on. Before most of the others could blink, Jen grabbed her brother and ran off again. Even though he had met the siblings less than an hour ago, they were the closest to being people he knew, now, he was alone. Wolf decided that now was the best time to put his head in Midoriya's lap again and huffed. This is always the hard part, Seeker said quietly. The waiting. It's even worse when it's someone you know. H how long have you known Ben? Midoriya asked. I had his file memorized by the time I was seven, Seeker replied. At first, Midoriya thought she was joking, but the side eye she was getting from everyone else suggested otherwise. But I've been close to the family for a long time. And then Ken found out you were a superhero, Superboy commented. How did he not recognize your voice? Seeker turned her head towards him. How do people not figure out who Superman is? His disguise is a pair of glasses. I use Superboy looked away. Shut up. As the group traded lighthearted barbs, Midoriya slowly started to relax again. He even managed to keep his stutter mostly under control when Seeker asked him about his Earth. Some of the things he told them earned him envious stares. You get paid to be a superhero, Zoom said, and a young woman wearing an orange and black outfit and armed with everything from guns to a sword patted him on the back. Most of us have to balance this stuff with another job. Speaking of which, Ravager, he stood up and looked at the woman. You're teaching class in a couple of hours, and I've got to run some evidence through the crime lab. Ravager sighed. Yeah, I wanted to see if the school could get a substitute, but no dice. Superboy, could you let Ken and Jen know we're pulling for them? No problem. Superboy waved them off. I'll keep you updated. Thanks, dude. Zoom picked up Ravager in his arms and vanished in a red and black blur. Sergeant Marvel sighed. I miss their old costumes. I think Zoom was tired of being called Kid Flash and Ravager. Seeker shrugged. I don't know, she got a little too attached during that undercover opus with Deathstroke. I don't know what you're talking about, Midoriya complained, though he kept his voice quiet. Ravager used to be called Artemis, Seeker explained. She was undercover with Red Hood and helped us expose an alien conspiracy. Zoom used to be Flash's sidekick, and now he does his own thing. Actually, a lot of us were sidekicks. Being a sidekick is also a job on my earth, Midoriya said, desperate to turn the conversation back to something he knew about. Some of them only stay there until they can form their own agencies, but others stay with a hero their whole careers. Again, we never get paid, someone further away grumbled. Midoriya ducked his head. 
as sorry, the conversations continued, and after a while, Midoriya was able to learn the aliases of everyone present, none of them gave their real names, but they assured him that it was nothing personal. Most heroes on this earth kept their identities secret, to prevent their enemies from attacking their friends and families. He only knew Ken and Jen by name because they had addressed themselves that way, but everyone emphasized how important it was to keep that to himself. How do you deal with that on your earth? Miss Martian asked. If you're a state employee, doesn't that mean that that information is available if someone tries hard enough? Actually, it's harder than you'd think, Midoriya said. Even though a lot of heroes' names are known, the government keeps personal information very secret. There aren't many specifics, but a team of people with intelligence-enhancing quirks use some of the best computers around to keep hackers out. What Midoriya didn't say was that there was an unspoken agreement between the heroes and the criminal underworld no going after families, on either side. For a villain to attack a hero's family meant never getting help from other criminals, and for the heroes and police to come crashing down on them. Heroes, on the other hand, didn't go after a criminal's family because of the potential retribution on their own. The entire arrangement kept conflict limited to those directly involved. Doing otherwise meant triggering a war with no winner. That had been one of Hawk's more sobering lessons during the last days of his internship. Another two hours passed before Ken came back from Midoriya. Sorry, guys, Dad just wants to thank the kid who saved his life. Those words were enough for everyone to breathe a sigh of relief, including Midoriya, who was unceremoniously pulled from his seat and taken to the infirmary in a blur of super speed. More people were inside, including a woman who seemed to be made of purple energy with pink light for hair. She held a small green and black slug creature in her arm. From the grip she had, it looked like she was under a great deal of stress and was taking it out on the poor thing. What lifted Midoriya's spirits, however, was Ben. He was still weak and pale, but he was awake. He sat up, one hand holding his wife's, while the other was being scanned by a device held by Asmuth. The treatment is going well, Asmuth said, oblivious to, or deliberately ignoring, Midoriya's presence. I'd say that you'll make a complete recovery in another five days. Just don't transform for that time. Ben's wife smiled and tightened her grip enough to make him wince. Don't worry, I'll make sure he stays in bed. A few others in the room chuckled, and Jen made a face. Mom, phrasing. Ben laughed. Yeah, you really should have thought about that one, Kara. When his wife glared at him, he held up his free hand in surrender. I'll be good, I promise. Asmuth scowled. If the treatment didn't rely on the Ultimatrix properly dispersing the antidote through your DNA, I'd deactivate it to make sure. I'll have to hope your family can keep you in line, for once. I know exactly what to do, Supergirl said, and hugged Ben tightly. Kara, air, nope, not letting go this time. Jen tugged half-heartedly at her mother's arm. Mom, he's turning blue. Midoriya leaned a little closer to Ken to whisper. Is this normal? Ken grinned. You should have seen them when I technically died a couple years back. They didn't let me do anything unsupervised for six months. At Midoriya's incredulous stare, he shrugged. Long story. Let's just say that us Tennysons are really protective when it comes to friends and family. Asma finally turned to regard Midoriya. Ah, uh, you're back. Unitrix, give him the Mark I. A blonde-haired woman in a white, silver-trimmed bodysuit sighed. It's been almost 30 years, and you still won't call me Eunice. Unlikely. The woman, Eunice, walked over and held out the Ultimatrix Midoriya was so used to. Here you go. Thanks for holding on to this, we wouldn't have been able to save Ben without it. Midoriya took the watch, but he was confused. How did I do anything? You needed the Ultimatrix, not me. The Ultimatrix was in complete standby mode, Asmuth said gruffly. If it hadn't found a user that matched its parameters, it would have self-destructed to keep it out of the wrong hands. If that had happened, all hope of a cure would have been lost. Eunice smiled. In other words, you being a hero is what saved Ben's life. Midoriya blushed as he put the Ultimatrix back on. There would have been other people who deserve the watch. Holo Ben flickered into view. I disagree. There were plenty on your earth who would have been heroes with the Ultimatrix, but they weren't you. At that point, Holo Ben noticed that everyone in the room was looking at him. Oh, right. Hi. Ben stifled a laugh. I totally forgot that I made the hologram look like me. Thanks for that, boss, Holo Ben said. I'm boss. Holo Ben crossed his arms. It's either that or dad. Boss is fine. The purple woman, who had seemed to be torn between laughter and tears, finally chose the former. Oh, this is good. This is almost worth being worried sick. Ben gave her a look. I'm so glad, grandma. Midoriya did a double take and then turned to Holo Ben. That's his grandma. He hissed. And why didn't you tell me about all of this? Holo Ben held up his hands. Hey, I didn't know. Ben never programmed me with any personal information. 
Just some basic stuff from before he turned 18. It's not like knowing his grandma was an anodite was going to help you be a hero. Midoriya had to admit that Holo Ben was right. It wasn't really his place to know Ben's personal life. He was about to apologize, but the door opened and the archer from earlier rushed in. Glad to see Ben's awake, but we have a situation, he said. Mr. Terrific needs as many hands on deck as possible. The man who looked like Superboy frowned. What's going on? A major seismic event around Metropolis. If the readings are right, the whole city could turn into a giant sinkhole. Ben tensed, but then sighed and leaned back. You guys go. I'll be fine, I promise. Everyone except Asmuth and Eunice nodded and began heading out. But then Midoriya raised his hand, like he was back in class. See can I help? Ultiman and Ultra Girl shared an amused look. Well, I have been telling him that we don't do the whole license thing here, the former said, and then patted Midoriya on the back. Come on, kid, it's hero time. There were two things Midoriya noted as he arrived at the Justice League's base in Metropolis, the Metro Tower. First, the city was a shining symbol of progress, with clean streets, gleaming buildings, and state-of-the-art technology. The second thing was that he did not like teleporting. Seriously, this again. Ultra Girl helped him out of the way as more leaguers and titans arrived on the scene. What is it with you and instant travel? I don't know, Midoriya groaned as he struggled to keep the contents of his stomach in place. Only a few seconds after he succeeded, the building shook and more than one person was knocked off their feet. What do I need to do? Ultiman stepped in at that point. Right now, our job is to help civilians and find out what's causing those tremors. After that, we'll move in to deal with it. Ultra Girl, take Midoriya and patrol the perimeter of the city. Mr. Terrific just told me that whatever is causing this is surrounding the city and I want you two to see if you can get ahead of this. You got it. Ultra Girl gently elbowed Midoriya. You might want to stay as an alien, secret identity and all that. Oh, all right. Midoriya sorted through his aliens, and then turned into Jetray. Okay, I'm ready. Ultra Girl nodded. All right, just stay with me. She floated into the air and started flying west. Don't fly ahead, I can't fly that fast. Jetray and Ultra Girl were among the dozens of leaguers and titans. At first, Jetray didn't want to say anything. But after a few minutes, the silence became unbearable. So, um what are your powers? He asked. I know that quirks aren't a thing on this earth, but you have more than one ability. Blame my parents, Ultra Girl said as she flew. Jetray noted that her eyes were glowing softly as she looked at the ground. My mom, Supergirl, is a Kryptonian, and she gave me some of her powers strength, speed, durability healing, enhanced senses, and x-ray vision. But dad's DNA got some additions that passed down to me from his aliens' invisibility, water jets, sea bombs, magnetic powers, and way big's cosmic ray. How does that work? The Ultimatrix was leaking alien DNA. She smirked at him. The same Ultimatrix you're using now. Jetri looked at the dial on his chest in alarm. Does that mean? No, Asma fixed that issue when he rebuilt the watch. Oh, good. There was too much going on in Midoriya's life for him to be thinking about possible kids getting alien powers. The silence resumed for a little while, but Ultra Girl was the one who broke it next. I guess I owe you an apology. F for what? Assaulting you, for one. Ultra Girl looked uncomfortable. I'm not usually like that. It's not an excuse, but I was just so worried about dad. I get it, Jetre assured her. If something happened to my parents, he shook off the thought before he could finish the sentence. The idea of anything happening to those he loved was too terrible to even consider. But anyway, you don't have to apologize, he said. Yeah, I really do. Ultra Girl frowned and hovered in place, staring down at something on the ground. I'm seeing something with my X-ray vision. Hang on. She put her finger to the earpiece she had. Ultiman, I've got eyes on something underground. Looks like a giant subway train, but it's carving a tunnel around Metropolis. At this rate, it could cause the whole city to fall into a sinkhole. Jetre's eyes went wide. From what he could see, Metropolis was huge, and millions of lives were at risk. What was causing such damage? As if to answer his question, there was an eruption of earth and metal, and an enormous mechanical monster emerged. It was huge, almost a hundred feet wide and several hundred feet long. Its head was tipped with a giant drill, while much smaller drills dotted its flanks. There was an electronic screech, and then the monster slammed into a building on the outskirts of Metropolis. To Jetray's horror, the half of the building that wasn't immediately crushed started to tilt and fall towards several more skyscrapers. Fortunately, Superman flew in and put his hands against the collapsing building, stopping its fall. Jetray stared at the display of power. Not even All Might could do that. He thought, I mean, he could do the strength part, I think, but he'd never be able to hold the building up at that location, because he can't fly. Ultra Girl brought her hand back up to her ear. Yeah, I saw that. 
Where do you need us? Okay, got it. Will we have backup? Fine, we'll make do. She turned to Jetray. Everyone else is tied down with damage control and rescue efforts. We're going inside that thing and taking it down. Can you handle this? Jetray nodded after a moment's hesitation. Why yes, but how are we going to get inside that robot? Ultra Girl looked down at the machine, and her eyes glowed again. First of all, I just x-rayed it, and it's some kind of vehicle. The cockpit is lined with lead, so I can't see who's driving. Second of all, can you use any aliens that can go intangible? Oh, right. Jetray would have facebombed if he didn't need both wings straight out to fly. What about you? Ultra Girl grinned. Oh, I'll be keeping this thing busy from the outside. Your magnetic powers can hold something that big. She laughed. No, I've got something a little more. Direct, in mind. She held her hand over her ultimatrix. It's time to go ultimate. Ultra Girl slammed down the dial on her ultimatrix. There was a flash of green light and the watch vanished from her arm. Though nothing seemed to outwardly change, Jetray could feel a pressure in the air around Ultra Girl. I love doing this. Ultra Girl flew back a short distance, and unlike before, when she seemed to focus to use her power, this was completely effortless. I'll keep it busy for a bit, and then I'll join you. Get to the control center, I think it's in the segment just behind the head. With that said, Ultra Girl flew at the machine with unbelievable speed. She drew her fist back and punched it square in the drill, rocking it back. Even from several hundred feet away, Jetray could see the sizable dent in the metal. Holo Ben materialized and let out a low whistle. I am really glad she never did that when she fought you. Why yeah, me too. Jetray tapped his own ultimatrix and turned into Ghost Freak. Okay, let's do this. Ultiman held up one hand and formed a dome of green mana to shield a small group of civilians from falling debris. Keep going. There are leaguers a block away to move you to safety. Most of the terrified people left, except for a beautiful woman with black hair. Ken, how are you holding up? Ultiman smiled. Don't worry, Aunt Lois, I'm fine. And before you ask, Uncle Clark is working to make sure the Daily Planet doesn't get knocked over. He paused, listening for something, and then laughed. He says he loves you, by the way. Lois Lane Kent smiled back and turned in the direction of the Daily Planet. Love you too, Smallville. The words were quiet, but they both knew Superman would hear her. Hey, where's your sister? Fighting a giant metal worm the size of Poland. Ultiman's smile faded. She went ultimate. Either she's still got some anger to work out, or she's worried. Lois looked concerned. She hasn't gone ultimate since the fight on Apocalypse. She hasn't needed to, Ultiman assured her. And she seems to be handling it well. I'll send some backup her way as soon as we evacuate this sector. And that won't happen until I'm gone, I get it. Lois gave her nephew a wave. Just promise to give me a few statements after this is done. Don't we always? You know you're the superhero community's favorite reporter. Ultiman kept an eye on Lois until she turned a corner. Okay, now we need to get this mess under control. Ghost Freak passed through the metal skin of the machine and then turned into Diamond Head. He barely got a few steps towards the control room when he was attacked by a dozen robots. At first, they moved too fast for him to really see what he was fighting, but Holo Ben had no such issues. Dude, you're fighting robot monkeys. Holo Ben laughed from inside the Ultimatrix. That is so weird, but also awesome. Diamond Head's arms turned into blades that he used to hack apart one of the monkeys. Easy for you to say, they're trying to kill me. The monkeys fired beams of green energy at him, but they only refracted off, hitting the ceiling, walls, and floor. Diamond had retaliated with a barrage of crystals that shredded most of the robots. The remaining few were smashed apart with his fists. This is a weird day, he muttered. This is only your third time doing anything in the field, Holo Ben reminded him. Fourth, if you count the entrance exam. I'm sure this sort of thing will be boring in a few years. That's not actually helping. Diamond had marched up to a thick door that blocked his way. His arm shifted into a thick blade. Let's see who's on the other side. The door shrieked as Diamond Head tore through it. Sitting in a chair, pressing at buttons and pulling levers, was a short man with red hair. If it weren't for the robot monkeys hovering protectively around him and the giant death machine he was driving he wouldn't have looked like more than a stressed college professor. The man glanced back at him. Oh, it's you. I got out of prison a week ago, and you're already going to put me back. He thinks you're Ben, Holo Ben said. Just fake it until you take him down. Right? I can do that. Diamond had put his fists on his hips. Looks like it. How about you surrender, and I won't have to hurt you. I'd rather take option two. The man pressed a button, and a wide-barreled cannon emerged from the floor. A cluster of explosives fired out, catching Diamond Head in the chest and sending him tumbling back. Oh, that felt good. A moment later, Ultra Girl crashed through the top of the machine and landed on the controls, destroying them. 
Not as good as punching you is gonna be for me, Ivo, she said, and cracked her knuckles, even as red beams shot from her eyes and destroyed the cannon that had shot Diamond Head. The man, Ivo, sneered. Well, if it isn't the half-Kryptonian, how is life living in Supergirl's shadow? If he was trying to get a rise out of Ultra Girl, he failed miserably. How's life in Maros? Whoever Maro was, mentioning him set Ivo off. That Cretan's designs are obsolete compared to my own. His name shouldn't even be spoken in my presence. Ultra Girl laughed. Nice to see your inferiority complex is going strong. She looked over at Diamond Head, who got to his feet. You okay? I'm fine, he said. Watch out for cannons in the floor, there might be more than one. I don't need a full cannon to deal with you, Ivo said to Ultra Girl. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a rock that glowed a sickening green. This will do nicely. As soon as the light touched Ultra Girl, she gasped in pain and fell to the floor. WRD did you. You'd be amazed at what I found in some of Luther's caches. Ivo gloated, there was a flash of green light behind him, and he turned. Try anything, and the girl. XLRA didn't reply as he tore through Ivo's monkeys, and then planted one foot in the man's face. At the speed he was going, Ivo flew through the air, and into a monitor on the far side of the room. Several teeth and a line of blood showed exactly where he'd come from. What's wrong? XLRA asked Ultra Girl, not caring about the unconscious criminal. K. Kryptonite, Ultra Girl said weakly, and pointed at the rock. The radiation. I'll take care of it. XLR8 slapped the Ultimatrix dial again, turning into a tall alien with black and yellow skin, pincers for hands and feet, and a metal head that floated between his spiked shoulders. Lodestar held out one hand, and a panel of metal tore out of the wall. He then wrapped it around the kryptonite, sealing it up. Ultra Girl took a few deep breaths, and Lodestar helped her sit upright. Color was already returning to her face, but she didn't look ready to go anywhere just yet. That was unfortunate in Lodestar's eyes, because the mechanical worm shuddered, and the hole in the roof was torn open wider. A moment later, Superboy dropped in, along with Seeker, Wolf, and a girl who seemed to be made of fire. The latter quickly shut off her power, revealing a teenager with red hair, who wore black pants and a midriff-bearing top, both of which were decorated with red flames. Everything okay in here? Superboy asked, looking at his cousin with concern. Yeah, feeling the aster, Ultra Girl said as she rose to her feet. It was Ivo, he had some of Luther's kryptonite. Superboy tensed. Where is that little weasel? Lodestar pointed. Over there. I, uh, may have hit him a little too hard. Seeker walked over to the small man and nudged him with one boot. Eh, he's been hit worse. Also, he put an entire city at risk, so I doubt anyone will care. Lodestar nodded, and then held up the ball of metal that contained the kryptonite. Um, what about this? The other girl grabbed it. I'll take it to someone, maybe Green Lantern. He'll throw it into the sun? Problem solved. Midoriya wasn't sure what scared him more that someone could actually take something close enough to the sun to throw it in, or that that statement had been made so casually. Seeker nodded. Thanks, Bonfire. We'll wrap things up here. Bonfire covered herself in flames once again, and then rocketed back the way she'd come. While Seeker put restraints around the unconscious Ivo, Wolf rested his head against Ultra Girl until she started to pet him. Superboy chuckled at the sight, and then patted Lodestar on the shoulder. Thanks, he said. Looks like the family owes you twice. Why you don't owe me anything? Midoriya protested as he turned back to normal. Superboy smiled. Too late for that, kid. To Midoriya's surprise, the cleanup and repair of Metropolis took little time at all. Ultiman and Verdona the Purple Woman, who also turned out to be Ben's grandmother, snapped their fingers, and the city was fixed in a matter of seconds. Most of the heroes headed back to the watchtower after that, including Midoriya, who was brought to the infirmary to speak to Ben. So, this has been a busy day for you, Ben said with a grin. You jumped universes and fought a supervillain, all on a school night. Not bad. Midoriya found the floor very interesting at that moment. Th thanks. You've had the Ultimatrix for about a year, right? Ben nodded to himself. I think you might be ready for the ultimate soon. What do you think, other Ben? Midoriya perked up. Holo Ben had told him a few times that the Ultimatrix was capable of sending some of his aliens into the most powerful stages of their evolution for short periods of time. Midoriya had been excited by the prospect, but Holo Ben had told him in no uncertain terms that he needed more experience in the field before he'd unlock that function. Of course, that had been before he'd fought real villains, a serial killer, and now, a giant mechanical worm controlled by a mad scientist. Holo Ben flickered into view. Definitely, he's improved a great deal faster than your original parameters suggested. He picks things up fast, I've already had to accelerate the guidelines twice. He paused and looked at Midoriya curiously. 
His grasp on all this is almost too good. Supergirl, who looked far more relaxed than before, reached out to ruffle Midoriya's hair. Maybe it's because he's smart. If I remember correctly, Ben, you weren't exactly a good student at his age. I have the third highest grades in my class, Midoriya offered. See what I mean? Supergirl laughed. Aren't you glad that the watch ended up on the wrong planet? Midoriya blinked. Wrong planet. Oh, right, the Ultimatrix ended up on my Earth by accident. Ben nodded. Yeah, my plan was to give the watch to someone from the Earth I originally came. I kinda wanted to give my Earth a protector. Still, I wish I knew why the Ultimatrix ended up on your Earth. From what Ken and Jen told me, you've got a lot of heroes to protect your planet. He paused. No offense, I'm sure you'll be great. At first, Midoriya was just relieved that Ben didn't want to take the Ultimatrix and go with his original plan. Then, he started to get more curious. Why had the watch come to his Earth? I believe I can answer that, Asmuth said, looking up from a holographic screen in front of him. Like is drawn to like, the Ultimatrix was lost in the void between universes, too far away from ours, Ben Tennyson, but close to another that was similar. Ben frowned. How are our Earths similar in energy? Not our Earths, Asmuth said, but the life in the Ultimatrix, and the life on the boy's Earth. What are you talking about? Midoriya asked. Tell me something. Asmuth looked up at him, and Midoriya thought he saw regret and sadness in his eyes. Have you ever wondered where quirks come from? Yuraka frowned at her phone, as if it was responsible for her irritated state. It had become a habit for the rising stars to talk to each other after school, but one star wasn't shining that night. Comet, has anyone heard from Izuku? Look, not in the five minutes since the last time you asked. Comet, sorry. Crayon, relax, Achako. I'm sure Midori is just busy. Maybe his mom needs him and he turned off his phone. Glasses, yes, I am certain that everything is alright. Comet, I know, it's just that he always responds. It's weird. Tape, hey, if he doesn't send any messages by tomorrow morning, I can ask Airjet to swing by his place. He patrols near Izuku's neighborhood on weekdays. Yuraka was touched that Siro would ask a pro hero to go out of his way to check on Midoriya, even though there was no evidence that anything was actually wrong. Even if there was, they could only say anything if they didn't hear from him after 24 hours or had proof that something bad had happened. Maybe she was just being paranoid. After all, the League of Villains had tried to kidnap him in Hasu and they might try again. What if they knew where he lived? She nervously started to pace. Yes, she was definitely paranoid, but she didn't care. You'd better have a good explanation for this. Well, Asmuth tapped his foot impatiently. Answer the question. Midoriya shrank back. Um, W. Well, the common theory is that a latent gene in our DNA activated about 200 years ago, and powers began developing at an accelerated rate. Four out of every five people on my Earth now have some kind of quirk, even if it's just a vestigial mutation. He was suddenly reminded of a man who lived in his neighborhood. His quirk was just a pair of hooks on the sides of his head. They didn't do anything, but he was so proud of them, and had sneered at his quirkless neighbor every chance he got. Midoriya had seen him once or twice since winning the sports festival. Now, he seemed terrified of the boy he'd thought inferior, then frowned. Okay, I'm not a scientist by any stretch, but I'm pretty sure that's a complete load. Asmuth, tell me that's a complete load. Oh, it is, Asmuth assured him. Such a drastic change in your species evolution wouldn't have happened without outside interference. Supergirl leaned back in her chair. Someone altered the humans on that earth. Why would they do that? As a proof of concept, Asmuth said. Ben stared at him for a long moment as he processed that. Asmuth, tell me you had nothing to do with that. I could, but it would be a lie. Midoriya looked between them. W wait, what? That's what I was going to say. Ben fixed Asmuth with a glare that would have impressed Aizawa. Start talking. Asmuth sighed and sat down at the foot of the bed. In that moment, he looked every bit his age. A long time ago, when I was working on the designs for the Omnitrix, I encountered a problem. I couldn't figure out how to stop the DNA of other species from permanently overriding that of the host. However, until I knew what such an override might look like, it would be a flaw that I couldn't fix. My best estimates were that it would take me another hundred years before I perfected the technology, and I refused to wait that long. Controlled experiments weren't yielding the data I needed, so I sought an alternative. This presented another obstacle genetic manipulation on a large scale is illegal in our universe. Then why didn't anyone say anything when I fixed the hybrid? Ben asked. The hybrid were intent on destroying the universe, Asmuth said. Besides, you did it to save them from extinction, and after the hybrids war, no one was in a position to do more than raise a protest, and you were so popular that to do so would be political suicide. 
As such, everyone just let it go. What I was planning had no motive other than to advance my own project. Even my best arguments wouldn't get past the lawmakers. However, the law only specified that large-scale genetic manipulation was illegal in our own universe. So I went to another. Upon reaching this other Earth, I seeded alien DNA into the genetic codes of the humans to be passed on to their children. The human genetic code is remarkably resilient, and the population made for excellent test subjects. I programmed the dispersal technology to eventually affect 80% of the population by the time the project was complete. The other 20% remained unaltered as a control group. After that was done, I observed the effects, I took my readings, and used them to build the safety features of the Omnitrix. At that point, Midoriya was fairly certain that his heart had stopped. Asmuth had just admitted that he had visited his Earth generations ago, altered the DNA of the human race, just so that he could speed up his own work. Hold on, he said shakily. My parents have quirks. Shouldn't I have been part of the 80%? Hem, Asmuth shook his head. No, the monitoring system I left in orbit would send out a kill code, if you will, removing the alien DNA from randomly selected humans if the percentages got too skewed. The 80-20 split was the optimal level. Midoriya didn't want to believe what he was hearing, and he almost thought he couldn't believe it. Unfortunately for him, his understanding of the universe of the multiverse had expanded enough that he really didn't have a choice. A part of him wanted to be furious with Asmuth for this violation of his Earth, but he was in too much shock to do more than stare. Then, on the other hand, looked outraged. If not for his wife keeping a firm grip on his shoulder, he might have reached out to grab the little alien. You experimented on a planet. He shouted. How many times did you threaten to take the Omnitrix away from me because I did something stupid? When you... Arg, Asmuth raised a brow at Ben's anger, but otherwise didn't react. I had made plans to remove the foreign DNA. It would have been a simple matter after only a generation, and I almost did so. However, I discovered something unexpected. So unexpected, in fact, that I chose to let the effects of my experiment become permanent. You see, the DNA of some of the aliens I use shouldn't have been compatible with others. But the human DNA acted as a bridge, allowing for offspring with abilities more varied and powerful than their parents. He crossed his arms. In a way, it was almost like a prototype of how the Ultimatrix allowed for the creation of your own children. Don't go there, Asmuth, Supergirl warned, her eyes now faintly glowing red. You leave our kids out of this. After everything you've said, I'm not sure I'd trust you anywhere near them ever again. Now it was Ben's turn to stop his wife from doing anything, but everyone knew that Supergirl could get free from Ben's hand at any moment. If you knew about my Earth, Midoriya said, how come it took so long for Ken and Jen to come over? Why didn't you just take the Ultimatrix back as soon as it arrived? I was going to, but not long after it came to your Earth, it found you. I've since learned the value of what a good-hearted human can do with that device, so I chose not to interfere. In fact, had Ben not been afflicted with that poison, I would have been content to let you live out your life blissfully unaware of my actions. Asmuth chuckled, but there was no humor in it. Even then, I almost considered not saying anything. Until you asked. I may keep many secrets, but I'm not a fan of lying. This Midoriya sank into his chair and put his head in his hands. This is too much. I can't he stopped and looked up. Wait, what about the animals? Asmuth blinked. Pardon, some animals have been documented with quirks, Midoriya said. My principal isn't human, and he's one of the smartest people on the planet. Ben raised an eyebrow, and then slowly turned. Asmuth, I didn't know. He said quickly, I haven't actually looked at the data over the last few decades, mostly because I've been dealing with your messes. We're still dealing with the fallout from the hybrid war. He stroked his mustache thoughtfully. It could be a random glitch in the dispersal matrix. After so many years, it might have degraded. I'll have to examine the readings. Yeah, you do that, Ben said, his voice dangerously low. You lectured me about all the times I messed up, and now I've found out that you're a hypocrite. Not really the first time, though. I don't want to remind you about the sword, do I? Asmuth actually flinched. No, you don't. He saw the looks he was getting from Ben and Supergirl, and sighed. I am sorry. I'll take my leave for now, we can talk about this later. Don't hold your breath, Supergirl muttered as Asmuth vanished in a flash of light. Ben sat back and rubbed at his eyes. Sorry, Izuku, I had no idea about any of this. If the reactions he'd seen were any indication, Midoriya believed him. However, he looked down at the Ultimatrix. How come you never said anything? Holo Ben appeared and shrugged. 
because nobody's DNA registered as tampered or damaged. At this point, quirks are normal for your Earth. He frowned. I mean, maybe if we met someone from that first generation, but it's been about 200 years. I'm pretty sure they're all dead. Midori aside, he tried to calm down, but everything from the last few hours, especially the recent revelation was starting to catch up with him. What happens now? Ben glanced at his phone. Well, we should probably get you home. You've been through a lot, and you have even more to process. W what about Asmuth? Ben grimaced. I'm going to talk to some people. I doubt he'll face any legal consequences, but his good name is going to take a hit once this gets out, assuming we let it get out. I'm angry with him, but Asmuth has done a lot of good for more than one universe. If you need anything, though, don't hesitate to call us. When Midoriya looked confused, Ben smirked. We can modify your phone to reach this universe, trust me. We owe you, Supergirl said. You brought us the cure for Ben, and you saved our daughter's life. If you ever need us, we'll be there. Midoriya stood and bowed respectfully. I it was no problem. Ben rolled his eyes. Kid, a bit of advice just say you're welcome. It'll speed things up. Oh, Midoriya hesitantly nodded. Why you're welcome. As for what we all just learned. Ben sighed. If I were you, I'd keep it under wraps. I don't think people would be happy if they found out your earth had been tampered with by an alien. If you do want to tell someone, make sure you trust them. Midoriya nodded again. There was no way he could keep this to himself forever, he'd have to tell someone, or it would eat at him until nothing was left. But who could he tell? His mother, possibly, but she wouldn't be able to give much advice. Nezu, he'd be able to process it quickly, but Midoriya wasn't sure how he'd take finding out that his existence was due to a glitch. The Big Three they were only two years his senior and had no idea about the Ultimatrix. His friends in the Rising Stars. The same problem. He then realized that he trusted all of them. As those he held closest, they deserved to know both about his world's secret and his own. It took another two hours, but Midoriya was eventually brought home. Or, rather, to the beach he'd started at, though he didn't recognize it. What happened to all the trash? He asked as he, Ken and Jen stepped through the portal. Even late at night, it was easy to see that the beach was pristine. Ken shrugged. All that garbage was bugging me, so I teleported it into the sun. It spoke volumes of how done Midoriya was with that day that he didn't react to that statement. Instead, he just nodded tiredly, which got an understanding smile from Jen. It's a lot to take in, she said. Just remember, you can call us if you need anything. I will. Thanks, Midoriya was about to ask for a ride to his house when Jen grabbed him in a rib-shattering embrace. Thanks, she whispered, for saving my dad. And me too, I guess. Midoriya would have been embarrassed, getting a hug from someone he'd known for less than a day, but he was too busy not being able to breathe. Jen, he gasped, air, sorry. Jen let him go, and when Ken cackled, she glared at him. Shut up, or I'll get revenge for that prank last week. Go right ahead, Ken dared, and then winked at Midoriya. I stole her phone and made it play Uptown Funk for three hours straight. Well, Valerie helped. I knew it. Jen dashed over and punched him on the arm. I knew you were covering for her. Midoriya hadn't realized until that moment how grateful he was for their antics. That, and their easy acceptance of everything that he'd found out today, had done wonders to soothe his nerves. It almost made him confident in his decision to tell his friends and family what he'd learned, and what he'd been keeping secret. Um, th thank you, he said as he sketched an awkward bow. I'm still trying to figure all this out, but I think I'm glad I know now. Kent, who had been holding his sister back with one hand against her forehead to keep her from hitting him, smiled. Hey, it's no trouble on our end, and remember, if you ever need something, just ask. Jen took advantage of her brother's distraction to kick him in the shin, and then turned to Midoriya. And if anyone asks, you're just talking to your cousins in America. It'll mesh with your cover story, too. Midoriya blushed. He had told the Tennysons and their extended family about what he'd said and done to explain his quirk, and they had all rolled with it in good humor. Ben had even said that he didn't mind having another cousin. Midoriya had been embarrassed, but there had been a warmth in his chest. His family really only consisted of his parents, so having people willing to even pretend to be part of his family meant a great deal. Ken pulled out his phone for a moment. Well, it's really late, and you've got school. He raised an eyebrow at Jen. And so do you, so we should all head home. Jen rolled her eyes, then hugged Midoriya again, much gentler this time. See you around, Izuku, don't be a stranger. Midoriya awkwardly hugged her back. Why yeah, I wouldn't mind talking to you all again. It was kind of fun. Jen laughed and stepped back. We'll try to have less killer mecha worms and mass chaos next time. Maybe do something smaller, like stop a bank heist. Ken nodded. Ooh, or catch airplanes when they fall out of the sky. Superman does that every other month. Those airlines have really bad maintenance policies, Jen commented as she headed for the portal. 
Bye, Izuku. Thanks again. After she was gone, Midoriya looked to Ken. I g guess she doesn't hate me anymore. Ken shook his head. She never hated you. She might have doubted you because you weren't the one dad meant to have the Ultimatrix, and she was stressed earlier today. But that's in the past for her. As far as she's concerned, she'll have your back, come hell or high water. He gently elbowed Midoriya. And so will I, and just about all of our friends and family. The superhero community is pretty close on my earth. Th thanks, Midoriya said, and sincerely meant it. And if why you guys ever need me, I'll always be ready to help. Ken ruffled his hair fondly. Yeah, I can see why the Ultimatrix chose you. You're a good kid. In a blur of motion, Ken brought him back to his home. It took Midoriya a moment to regain his balance, and when he turned to say goodbye one more time, Ken was already gone. Well, I can always talk to them later, he thought, and opened the door. He had barely entered the house when he saw his mother sitting on the couch and looking very annoyed. He also noticed that she was holding the note he'd left. Um, I'm home. Inko narrowed her eyes. I would like an explanation, Izuku. Her gaze traveled to the Ultimatrix. And you, Ben. Ben flickered into view and made a show of hiding behind Izuku. Busted. By the time Izuku and Ben finished their story, it was almost two in the morning. Inko had spent the last twenty minutes drinking tea. She held the cup with trembling hands as the weight of Asmuth's revelations came crashing down on her. And you had no idea about any of this, she said to Ben. The hologram shook his head. I was programmed with limited information on the real Ben, and even less on Asmuth. I had no clue he'd even been to this universe, much less experimented on the people here. Inko frowned and set aside her cup. She reached towards the television remote, and it slowly flew to her hand. I, I have a lot to think about, but I do want to know one more thing. She looked Ben in the eye. The other Ben was proud of Izuku. He was completely selfless. Ben gave Izuku a look. Maybe a little naive, but his heart was in the right place. If I needed proof that he was the worthiest person to wield the Ultimatrix, I have it now. Inko nodded. She walked over to her son and gave him a hug. You scared the living daylights out of me. Izuku, please, if you're going to do something like this again, give me more than a note. Izuku hugged her back. Why you're not mad? Well, I'm not happy you ran off, but I've been encouraging you to be a hero for a year now. I'd be a hypocrite to be mad at you for doing the right thing. She smiled up at her son. And you save lives today, without getting hurt. I'm proud of you, my little hero. Izuku couldn't stop the tears that flowed down his cheeks, and his mother was quick to do the same. Thanks, mom. Now, I think you should get some sleep. Inko's wobbly smile was a perfect match for her sons. Proud or not, you still have school. Yeah, okay. Good night, mom. Izuku headed for his room and collapsed on his bed. That went better than expected. Ben nodded. I kinda expected you to get grounded. I guess she was just happy you're okay. Izuku was about to close his eyes when his phone buzzed. With a start, he realized that he'd missed dozens of messages from his friends while he'd been away. I need to tell them. Ben shrugged. It's your decision, buddy, but you should at least let them know you're okay, right? Izuku took a deep breath and accessed his messenger app. None of his friends were active, but it wouldn't hurt to give them a message for when they woke up. All might, hi, guys. I want you all to know that I'm okay. Sorry for not getting back to you sooner. Some stuff came up that I can't get into now. I promise to explain everything after school. Izuku wondered if any of them would want to be his friends after he told them the truth. Maybe they'd even hate him. It would hurt, but he would understand. Even if they didn't want anything to do with him after this, they deserve to know. Yuraka could say with some confidence that she'd gotten good at reading Midoriya. Granted, he wasn't exactly a subtle person at the best of times, but her point stood. A casual observer might say that he was his typical nervous self as he got to school that morning. But Yuraka saw that it went deeper than that. Every time his gaze landed on someone, it was as if he was seeing them with new eyes, and what he saw shook him. He also looked tired, there were bags under his eyes, and if it weren't for the aforementioned anxiety, he looked ready to fall over. Yuraka not to mention the rest of their friends was more than a little curious about what Midoriya wanted to tell them. When they tried to get answers at lunch, he froze, looked around nervously, and told them in no uncertain terms that it had to wait until they were alone. Whatever he wanted to talk about, it was for those he trusted most, apparently. On the one hand, it was touching that Midoriya trusted them that much, but on the other hand, Yuraka was nervous about whatever he wanted to tell them. It was obviously important, but there was a haunted look in his eyes that had Yuraka wary. When school finally ended, Midoriya led them to Gym Alpha, which was empty. I sent an email to Nezu-sensei last night and asked if he could make sure we could use this place, he said. He'll be here soon. Yuraka blinked in surprise. She hadn't known that Midoriya had regular contact with the principal, 
and if her friend's reactions were anything to go by, neither had they. Aw, good, you're here. Sure enough, the little principal strolled into the gym, a steaming mug held in one paw. My apologies, Midoriya-san, but the others you requested can't be here today. If you wish, you can tell them later. Midoriya nodded. Thank you, Nezu-sensei, I will. He took a deep, shuddering breath and turned to his friends. So you're probably wondering what this is about. Yes, Todoroki answered simply, with one eyebrow raised. Right, Midoriya sat down on a bench and stared at his watch. I need to tell you all some things. I lied to you about some stuff, and I learned something yesterday that I had to share with someone. If you don't want to be friends with me afterwards, I understand he paused and rubbed at his eyes for a moment. But you deserve to know the truth. Yuraka sat next to him. Deku-kun, what is it? Midoriya waited until everyone had found a seat somewhere Nezu had decided that Ida's shoulder made for a good perch and then held his watch out in front of him. Show them. The other students all jumped when a boy in a green jacket suddenly flickered into view. He smiled and waved at them. Hi, everyone, he said. I am the tutorial program for the Ultimatrix. I was created in the image of Ben Tennyson. You can all just call me Ben. Yuraka stared and then turned to Midoriya who was keeping his eyes locked on his feet. Izuku, right, so this started about a year ago. It took several hours for Midoriya to tell them the entire story. By the time he was done, everyone had missed their trains home, but no one really cared. They were rooted to the spot as they processed everything they had learned. Even Nezu was unable to keep up his cheery smile and was deep in thought. Aliens, that was the first word Yeyarazu had said since the story began. She had taken notes at first, but her arms had hung limply at her sides for a while now. We have our quirks because of alien DNA. Why yeah? Midoriya swallowed nervously. I reacted pretty much the same way last night. Ashido was sitting on the floor, staring at her hands with wide eyes. So, if this azimuth guy hadn't messed with our planet I wouldn't be pink. I believe that Izuku is saying that none of us would look as we do, Ida said, absently reaching down to rub one of his calves. Except, perhaps, Izuku and Momo, or anyone whose quirk does not alter their appearance. Siro's hand drifted to one elbow, and this was done to us because that guy was trying to build that watch. Ben, who had chimed in whenever Midoriya had seemed stuck, waved his hand in a so-so manner. Technically, it was for the Omnitrix, but yeah. Izuku, why didn't you tell us about that what did you call it? The Ultimatrix. Why didn't you tell us sooner? Yuraka looked like she was about to cry, whether it was from a sense of betrayal or just being overwhelmed by everything she'd learned. It made Midoriya flinch. I'm really sorry. He shrank in on himself, arms pulling his knees to his chest. I just everyone always treated me like I was worthless because I didn't have a quirk. And then you guys became my friends. And I thought, you were so used to people wanting nothing to do with you because you're quirkless, so you thought it might happen again. Asui, who sat on his other side, nodded shakily. That's it, ribbit, right. Midoriya could only nod. The part of Yuraka that wasn't reeling from what she'd just learned wanted to be upset with him. They were friends, and he had lied to them all since day one though the lack of surprise on Nezu's face when Midoriya had explained the Ultimatrix suggested that he knew about it. On the other hand, Midoriya had said before that he'd never had friends because he thought he was quirkless when in reality, he was quirkless. Yuraka had nothing against quirkless people, but she had seen reports on the news about the occasional hate crime against those without quirks. She had always thought that that was ridiculously bigoted, but after what she had learned, the quirkless were the most normal of them all. She looked down at her hands and the soft pads on her fingertips. If Asmuth had never experimented on their earth, would the lack of those pads be the only thing different about her? Would she have been the same kind of person? Would she have ever met her friends? Would I have never met Deku-kun? Yuraka didn't know it, but all of her friends were going through similar thoughts. And all of them considered, in a moment of irrationality, to blame Midoriya. But he was as shocked as they were, with the benefit of having an extra day to process it. And just because he was quirkless didn't mean he was unaffected by Asmuth's actions. He was quirkless because of Asmuth, which had left him feeling like a freak for most of his life. The Ultimatrix had finally allowed him to fit in with everyone else and even be admired for it, which was why he had lied. If anything, coming clean was a sign of how much he trusted them all. Yuraka couldn't find it in her to be mad at him. Still, is there anything else you haven't told us? Midoriya blinked. Or I've been training with the big three on Ceres. Yeyurazu tilted her head. That explains why Hado-san had that nickname for you. But what does that have to do with your other secrets? And nothing. Midoriya flinched again when his friends all gave him a look. 
I don't know, it was the only thing I haven't told you. Iraraka sighed and rested her head on Midoriya's shoulder. Okay, okay, so, what do we do now? Nezu shook himself out of whatever thoughts were plaguing him and addressed the students. I suggest that we keep this information to ourselves. Even if anyone were to believe us, the result would only be mass panic. Our society is already a powder keg. There's not need to keep the gasoline next door. He glanced up at Midoriya. However, if you think Tagata-san, Hado-san and Amajiki-san can be trusted, I will ensure that they will be present. Th thank you, Nezu-sensei. Midoriya tentatively put his arm around Yuraraka's shoulders. So, you aren't mad. Yuraraka frowned. I'm not happy that you lied to us, but I understand why you did. Just promise me that you won't do it again, please. I see can't say that I'll share secrets that aren't mine. Midoriya said nervously, but if it has anything to do with me, I'll come to you guys. Ashido giggled. At first, everyone thought it was because of how cute Yuraraka and Midoriya looked together, but then they heard the slightly hysterical edge to it. And how are we gonna deal with the fact that we're all part alien? She asked. To everyone's surprise, it was Todoroki who answered. Honestly, it doesn't matter much to me. It answers where quirks come from, but it doesn't affect our daily lives, does it? We are who we are. Finding out the origins of quirks doesn't change that I want to be a hero. At the unspoken challenge in his tone, his classmates straightened up. You are absolutely right, Shoto. Ida began chopping enthusiastically. If anything, we should be proud that the past has forged us into aspiring heroes. I agree, Yeyorazu said, and smiled at Midoriya. And thank you for trusting us. Ashido looked uncertain for a moment, but then, to the surprise of everyone, Todoroki put a hand on her shoulder, and she smiled. Hey, I just realized, she said, now, I really am the alien queen. That was the last straw. That little joke was enough to send all of the students into a laughing fit. Some of the laughter was a release of stress, and the rest was relief, though their view of the world had changed. That didn't mean that their chosen paths had. They would still become heroes, and they'd do it together, a universe away. Ben rolled his eyes as Kara literally carried him into the house. We could have just had the watchtower teleport us home. Considering what you've been through, I'm not risking you getting your molecules tossed a million miles for at least a week, Kara said archly. Ben raised an eyebrow, still, taking a javelin into the atmosphere and then flying us home. I think you're overdoing it. Kara just shook her head as she sat Ben on the couch and then ran her fingers through his gray hair. First you got those gray streaks, and now this. You're starting to look your age. Hey, I'm like a fine wine, Ben protested, and then grinned roguishly. I just get better with age. Kara smiled good-naturedly, and then kissed his cheek. Stay here, I'll heat up those leftovers. With the microwave this time, Ben asked nervously. You almost set the house on fire with your heat vision last week. You're lucky you're recovering, or I'd throw you into the sun for that. Kara poked him in the shoulder, though it was with enough force to knock him over on the couch. I'll be back in a minute. Ben watched her leave, and then closed his eyes for a moment. I know you're there, Paradox. Between Bruce and you, I'm good at knowing when someone's sneaking up on me. Professor Paradox smiled as he stepped into view. Hello, Ben, it's good to see that you survived your ordeal. Ben opened his eyes and glanced at an old clock nearby. The hands had stopped moving, which meant that Paradox had stopped time for this little conversation. Whatever his time-traveling friend wanted to talk about, he didn't want to be interrupted. I'm guessing that there are timelines where I didn't make it. Paradox's smile turned sad. Indeed, there are infinite possibilities across the multiverse, my friend. He then held out a paper bag. Gumball. Ben glanced back in the direction of the kitchen. A car is frozen in time right now, so what the heck? As Ben popped the candy in his mouth, Paradox turned to face the clock. How long will you be mad at Asthma for? Probably a while, Ben admitted. What he did was wrong, and he knew it. He was desperate to finish the Omnitrix, Paradox said. You may not be aware. But your universe was on the verge of dozens of wars, and Asmuth had become convinced that the Omnitrix was the best chance of peace. But it was never used for that purpose, Ben pointed out. What changed? The plumbers were able to defuse the situation in key areas, creating a domino effect. Asmuth chuckled. You might have noticed that Asmuth gets tunnel vision when it comes to his passion projects. Ben sighed. Like I said, what he did was wrong, but he is still one of the only friends I have left from back home, even if he is a huge jerk half the time. But I'm guessing you didn't come here to discuss the drama. Sadly, no. Paradox turned to face him, and Ben saw something he never thought he'd see in his eyes fear. I came to deliver a warning. Something is coming, Ben. Something so dangerous that even I dare not stray too close to look for details. When it comes, the champions of the multiverse must band together, or we will all die. Ben rested his elbows on his knees and sighed. 
How long do we have? A year at the most, but likely far sooner. Paradox pulled out a pocket watch and stared at it for a moment. For now, I am doing what I can to locate those champions. Two are on this earth, which is why I am here to warn you. I'll be ready, Ben promised. That is assuming that you are one of those champions, Paradox warned. This is a cosmic game, with rules and players that have been chosen eons in advance by forces beyond even my comprehension. All I have narrowed down is that one of this world's champions is a Tennyson, but it might not be you. Got it. Ben made a mental note to have his family train harder over the coming months. Any other news? I believe that two more champions are from Midoriya's Earth. Paradox shrugged. It is likely that your young friend is one of them. However, I do have a lead on how to locate the others. Please inform the Justice League that I will be borrowing John Constantine for a while. Zatanna won't be happy, but I'll let them know. Ben tried to relax, but with Paradox's warning fresh in his mind, it was hard. Say hi to Secret for us, okay? We haven't seen her in a while. Of course, she's just running some errands for me. Paradox paused, and then put his hand on Ben's shoulder. Be vigilant, my friend, this danger, this crisis threatens all of creation. I do not think all of us will make it out of this alive. Ben blinked at that, and when he did, Paradox was gone, and time resumed its march. He sat back to think, and didn't notice Kara's return until she placed the food on his lap. Here you go, she said, and then saw how pale her husband was. Ben, what is it? Ben picked up his fork, but his appetite was gone. I just got a visit from an old friend. The music starts, and the scene opens to show Midoriya walking to school. Polo Ben walks behind him, only to fade and be replaced by the real Ben Tennyson. He also fades as Midoriya enters the gates of UA and runs up to his friends. There are several fast shots of them in different classes, and then it changes to them in various stages of putting on their costumes. The scene changes again, this time, the rising stars are split up. Yeyarazu, Yuraraka and Ashido are fighting thugs at the USJ, Siro and Asui are leaping over obstacles, and Midoriya, Todoroki and Ida are facing Stain. The scenes dissolve and leave Midoriya, battered and bruised, with his visor on the ground, facing a line of enemies. On the left is Stain and the first Namu, while on the right is Shigaraki and Kirajiri. In the center is a tall, shadowy figure who reaches out for him. Midoriya takes a step back, only for hands to rest on his shoulders and back. He turns his head and sees Holo Ben on his right, Ben on his left, and All Might and Hawks directly behind him. The four of them fade, replaced by the rising stars, and the big three behind them. Further back is the rest of Class 1A and the UA teachers. Midoriya blinks away tears, and then picks up his visor. He secures it on his face, smiles, and then holds up the Ultimatrix. Yeyarazu was objectively an extremely intelligent girl. It was obvious that she was a genius after spending just a few minutes with her. However, she had a tendency to overthink things, to the point that she would miss the obvious. In this case, she was kicking herself for not figuring out that Midoriya's quirk was something completely different. In fact, she was surprised that no one had ever called him out on the Ultimatrix. People were just so enamored with his power, because that was how one was judged in a society where quirks were everything. Considering that Midoriya didn't actually have a quirk, and was reminded every day when someone said how cool he was, it must have been painful. Now that Yeyarazu knew the truth, that simple fact made her sick. Midoriya had been living in constant fear that someone might find out about the watch. And if the truth came out, the government would probably take the Ultimatrix away, and Midoriya would be arrested for fraud. All because he wanted to help people. On the next Sunday, when her friends were at her house, she called on one person who might have an idea of how to help Midoriya though calling him a person was up for debate. Then, she called out softly from the kitchen, where she was getting snacks for the next movie. Are you there? It had taken a few days for Midoriya's friends to get used to Ben, but now that they knew about him, they made an effort to include the hologram whenever they could. Soon, it was like he had always been a part of the group though, technically, he had. He just couldn't spend the same amount of time with them. He had explained that he could either allow only Midoriya to see him, or everyone, so he had to be careful. To her surprise, the hologram did indeed flicker into view. Yeah, just taking a tour of the place. Your house is huge. I mean, I already knew that, but it's something else to wander around. You can do that. Yeyarazu didn't know how she felt about the AI that could turn invisible to all but Midoriya at the drop of a hat wandering through her home. Ben shrugged. The range is limited, but I got a good look at the aquarium. How did your parents get a hammerhead shark? They never told me. Yeyarazu muttered, a little sullen, but then returned her focus to her question. Anyway, I was hoping you could tell me something. Sure, go ahead. Ben crossed his arms. There are a few things I can't disclose, though, it would go against my programming. 
right? Um, Yeyorazu glanced back in the direction of her friends. Is Izuku all right? Ben tilted his head. In what way? It's just that he's been jumpy since I've met him, and I suspect he's been that way for a long time. Yeyorazu frowned. He was mistreated by people because he's quirkless. Is he still afraid of that happening again? Probably, Ben said. He doesn't talk about it as much as he used to, so I think he's doing better. Actually, he's been a little less nervous than normal since he came clean with you guys. You are the first real people to be his friends, and I think that's all he cares about. Yeyorazu was touched, but also worried. With so few people that cared for the real Midoriya, it was a small foundation. He's powerful, but he's still fragile. Thank you for telling me, she said. I promise that we'll do all we can for him. Careful how you phrase that, Ben teased. Iraraka's already making moves, and I don't think Izuku's poor heart could handle two girls fighting over him. Yeyorazu blushed at the implication. Though it wasn't true, yes, Midoriya was cute, but he wasn't her type. For one thing, she preferred someone who didn't have to tilt their head back to look her in the eye. Ben grinned and vanished, leaving Yeyorazu to fume alone. After a minute, she grabbed the snacks and rejoined the others in the theater. There, she saw what Ben had been talking about Uraraka was pressed into Midoriya's side, head on his shoulder. She had been doing that a lot over the week, and Yeyorazu suspected that it was only a matter of time before one of them finally confessed to the other. Midoriya, slightly red-faced from Ashido's teasing, if the pink girl's saucy grin was anything to go by turned and smiled at her. H. Hey, Momo, Tenya was about to start the movie. Then I came at the right time, Yeyorazu said as she handed out the food, though she knew Ida wouldn't have started without her. She then took the spare seat on Midoriya's other side. I think you'll like Thor, Achako. I don't know, Iron Man has been really good so far. Yuraraka barely shifted to look at the other girl. What's this Thor guy got? A hammer that defies gravity, Yeyorazu teased. Yuraraka reached around Midoriya and held out one hand. Popcorn, please. The following Monday, Class 1A took their seats and waited for Aizawa to enter. As always, he gave them a sharp look to make sure that the students weren't goofing off. When he saw them sitting attentively, he nodded. All right, before we begin, there's an announcement I need to make. Aizawa shuffled a few papers on his desk. In a few weeks, you'll have your final exams before summer. I expect you all to study and train even harder. The written portion will be your most difficult so far, and the practical portion is brutal. He gave the class one of his rare sadistic smiles. Students have been known to drop out of the hero course altogether just from trying to pass. Midoriya bit his lip nervously, but the groan from Ashido was telling. Thanks to tutoring from him, Yeyorazu and Todoroki, she had risen to 15th in the class. However, a bad grade on the written part of the finals would send her plummeting back down to the bottom. Aizawa sighed, as if what he was about to say next personally offended him. Don't worry, there's more than just the stick as an incentive. The metaphorical carrot is the summer training camp that UA holds every year. Think of it as a camping trip, though you'll be working to improve your quirks and your skills while there. Before the class could even finish the first murmurs, Aizawa's hair rose and his eyes glowed, and they settled down. However, if you fail the test, you can forget about going in fact. If you do badly enough, you should seriously rethink being a hero. Only the best will graduate from UA and become pros. Remember that. The class mulled that over as they started working. But as soon as they got a break, they split up into groups to talk amongst themselves. We're all going to the summer camp, right? Yuraraka asked. I don't want to go without you guys, and I don't want to be left behind. Ida nodded vigorously. I feel the same. The coming weeks will push our bodies and minds to their limits, and beyond. Midoriya had an idea about that, though he'd have to ask Nezu if it was okay. He was sure that it was, but he would have a lot of apologizing to do if he was wrong. Hey, remember what I said I did on Ceres? He whispered. I think you could all join me. It might help for the practical exam. And we can study at Yamomo's house for the written portion. Ashido clasped her hands and pouted at Yeyorazu. You'll help me, right? Of course, the other girl said. But I expect you to have better than a passing grade. Ashido gave her a thumbs up. You got it. And then we can have fun at the summer camp. Oh, I can't wait. First, let's pass the exam, Ribbit, Asui said. Then we can have fun. Siro cracked his knuckles. Then let's get to it. Hero training that day was one they were all looking forward to combat training, which included quirks. All Might was the teacher that day, along with Nezu, who had stopped by. Have any of the students shown any noticeable changes? Nezu asked. Good or bad, but I would like to know. All Might nodded. They've all shown at least a little improvement, but I'd say that the highest marks have to go to young Bakugo, as well as young Midoriya and his friends. His eyes widened. Excuse me. The symbol of peace vanished in a blur and caught Kirishima before he collided with the far wall. 
The boy looked up at him and grinned. He was a little scuffed up, but his full body hardening had kept him from getting too hurt. Thanks, All Might Sensei, he said. I got taken by surprise. Can I get back to the fight? Yeah, Wrath isn't done with this fight. Midoriya's newest transformation had surprised All Might. Its form wasn't the strangest, but its impact on his personality had been polarizing. Wrath, as he called himself, looked like a humanoid tiger with a large claw curving forward on the back of his hands. He wore jeans and a black tank top, and the dial that came with all his transformations is part of a belt. The man-tiger bounced eagerly on the balls of his feet, impatient to go at Kirishima once again. His fighting style had been pure aggression, the unstoppable force to Kirishima's immovable object. Well, immovable until Wrath had punched him out of the ring with the force of a cannon. Very well, you too, but please try not to destroy the entire gym, All Might said, and put Kirishima down. We'll do our best. Kirishima took a moment to reinforce his hardening, and then charged. Come on, Midoriya, don't tell me that's the best you've got. Wrath let out a roar and met him head on. Let me tell you something, Kirishima Ijiro. Wrath only held back because he didn't want to break the school, but you asked for it. Kirishima held up his arms to block Wrath's punch. This time, he braced himself properly which kept him from another involuntary flying lesson. Still, he was sent reeling. The force from the blow was enough that he could feel it through his hardening. With his arms covering his face, Kirishima didn't see Wrath's open hand until he gripped his wrist and heaved him over his shoulder. Wrath slammed him up and down for what felt like an eternity, the attacks coming so hard and so fast that Kirishima couldn't react. It was all he could to do maintain his hardening, but he could feel his control slipping. Finally, Wrath let go. But Kirishima had barely started to get up from the mat when he saw his opponent jump into the air. Body parallel to the floor and elbow extended in a way that Kirishima had only seen on TV. You've gotta be kidding me. Polaris Piledriver. The impact was too much for Kirishima and he was forced out of his hardening. The breath left his lungs in a rush and his body immediately felt like one giant bruise. Barely able to move, he tapped his hand weakly against the mat to signal that he was done. Wrath jumped to his feet and pumped a fist. Yeah, Wrath wins. Wrath is king. Siro, who had taken a break after his own spar with Sato, chuckled. Hey, your majesty, you wanna tone it down a notch. Fine, whatever, Wrath growled, but tapped the dial on his belt and turned back to normal. He immediately ran over to Kirishima and helped him up. I'm so sorry, Kirishima-san. I told you Wrath was dangerous, but I've never actually used him in a fight, so I got a little carried away. Kirishima took a few deep breaths, but grinned with good humor. Hey, no worries, Midoriya, I mean, I've been bugging you to use that one since last week. He winced. Damn, but Wrath packs a punch. All might let go of the tension he hadn't realized he'd had until now. Midoriya had struck him as a very kind soul, so seeing him fight so ruthlessly was alarming. He had been ready to intervene if the boy took things too far, but it turned out that he had enough self-control to stop. Once again, All Might felt a little ashamed of himself. Every time Midoriya used a new part of his quirk, he was reminded of all for one. During their fight six years ago, that man had pulled out a new power every ten seconds, and while none of them had been as outwardly drastic as Midoriya's transformations, seeing someone with such variety brought up too many bad memories. His mind and his heart told him to be kinder to his student. But something maybe his instincts, maybe the remnants of one for all seeing a similarity between Midoriya and his nemesis screamed threat. Even Nezu's assurance that there was no connection hadn't completely removed his doubts. At least young Midoriya has friends to keep him on the straight and narrow, he thought, as Siro and Todoroki walked over and started talking to Midoriya. I doubt all for one ever had anyone even try. Asui was the first to notice that something was off about Midoriya and Yuraraka as school ended. It was a small thing, really. Both looked like they were about to speak to one another, but then decided against it at the last second. At first, Asui ignored it, but it happened more and more as they prepared to leave the school. Finally, when Yuraraka glanced at her for a split second, Asui saw the embarrassed question in her eyes, and she made her decision. Make a distraction, she whispered to Siro. Trust me, Siro maintained his smile as easily as Asui maintained her blank expression, and reacted with believable surprise when she stepped on his foot. He yelped in pain, though Asui hadn't stepped that hard, and tape shot out of one elbow in reflex. It hit Todoroki, who stumbled into Ashido, and they both fell. Ida and Yeyarazu hurried over to check on them. Siro apologized profusely, maintaining the facade for another few minutes, until the realization dawned on them. Midoriya and Yuraraka were gone. H. Hey, Achako, what's going on? Midoriya stumbled as Yuraraka pulled at his wrist. 
We should check on the others. It's fine, she assured him, though her words were shaky. I asked Sue to do something, and I guess she got Ciro to make a scene. I just I needed to talk to you in private, and I didn't want to be rude to everyone else. Oh, Midoriya blinked. Yuraraka had brought them to a shady corner of campus, under a tree. I gee guess I wanted to talk to you, too. Really, Yuraraka wished her heart would stop beating so fast. It was probably unhealthy at this point. Wait, hold on a second. Then, thankfully, no one else was around when Ben flickered into view. Yeah, can you also give us a minute? Yuraraka bit her lip. She could feel her face heating up. Please, sure thing. Ben grinned knowingly at them, then plugged his ears and slowly faded away. La la la, I'm not listening. After he was gone, Yuraraka and Midoriya looked at each other and stared for a moment. As so, I was wondering, Deku-kun, can I ask? The words jumbled together as both spoke at the same time. They stopped, and both opened their mouths to speak. They stopped again, smiled, and laughed. You go first, Yuraraka said. No, you brought us here, Midoriya insisted. You go first. Yuraraka took a deep breath. Come on, Achako, you can do this. You've faced villains, this is nothing. Oh, who am I kidding? I'd take villains over this any day. Okay, Deku-kun Yuraraka looked up into his eyes. I, uh, wanted to know if you were doing anything after school on Friday. Nothing in particular Midoriya's brow furrowed. Yuraraka could practically see him put the metaphorical pencil to paper, ready to connect the dots. Why? I was wondering if you'd all like to go somewhere with me. Yuraraka mentally patted herself on the back for only stammering once, before going in for the knockout. And, to be clear, I mean this as, as a date. As expected, Midoriya's face turned an alarming shade of red, unexpectedly, rather than flail about. He gave her that wobbly smile that she found adorable. Ah really? Sure, I mean, IW was going to ask why you the S same TH thing. They stared at each other for a long moment, and then both burst out laughing. We're hopeless, aren't we? Yuraraka wiped away a tear. The others have been teasing us for weeks, and now, they're never going to let us live this down. Midoriya said ruefully, but his smile never faded. The but, um, what are we going to do on our DD date? Yuraraka froze. You know, I was so focused on this moment, I didn't actually think that far ahead. They both fell into another fit of giggles. Yeah, it's like you said. Midoriya tentatively reached out and took her hand. We're hopeless. Yep. Yuraraka looked up at him, and then blinked. Darn it. I need to catch my train, but I don't want to leave. We'll see each other tomorrow. Midoriya offered. Yuraraka smiled. She then took a moment to gather her courage for one more step, and gently kissed him on the cheek. Midoriya froze, to the point that he actually thought his heart stopped. Yuraraka Achako, the girl he'd finally admitted to having feelings for, had just kissed him. For a moment, all he could focus on was her face, the blush on her cheeks, her smile, and her sparkling eyes, all of which changed into a mortified expression, and Midoriya felt his heart drop into his stomach. Had he done something wrong? Was she regretting her actions? Did she realize that she didn't really like him after all? Then he saw that she wasn't looking at him, rather, at something behind him. He turned, and saw the rest of their friends watching them. Yeyurazu had her hands over her mouth as she bounced in place. Ashido and Siro had matching grins. Ida had a proud smile on his face. The only ones who hardly reacted were Asui and Todoroki. Both kept their expressions blank, though they each gave a thumbs up, then flickered into view and took one look at Midoriya and Yuraraka. He grinned, and a bow appeared in his hands. Arrows with heart-shaped tips appeared next, and he pretended to shoot them at the new couple. So, um, Yuraraka took a step back, and then started to run. See ya guys tomorrow okay bye. To avoid further embarrassment for the day, Midoriya ran along with her to get to his own train. If they happened to brush against each other as they ran, they didn't comment, but it was probably one of the reasons they couldn't stop smiling. Oh, my baby. Izuku was starting to wonder if his mother had a strength-enhancing quirk that she'd never revealed, if her rib-cracking hug was anything to go by. To be fair, he should have known that she'd react like that when he told her about what had happened with Yuraraka, along with the rivers of tears. I'm so happy for you, Izuku. Inko finally took a step back and wiped her tears away. This girl sounds absolutely wonderful, and I know that she's lucky to have you, too. Mom, Izuku looked away, embarrassed, but he couldn't keep the goofy grin off his face. Why yeah, I think I'm pretty lucky. Well, I'll leave you to it, young man. Inko smiled as brightly as her son could ever remember. I'm just glad that you're having some normalcy in your life. I was worried you'd be so involved with becoming a hero that you'd shut out everything else. Izuku thought about how his friends had decided to stick with him, even after finding out he'd lied to them. I don't think I have to worry about that, mom. 
Good, oh, and about your date. Izuku shivered at the mischievous look in his mother's eyes. I don't have a problem with you going out since I know you'll have a chaperone. Right, Ben? Ben, who had been sitting on the couch watching them, nodded. You got it. I'll make sure they're home at a reasonable hour. Izuku gave him a look. How would you do that? Ben pointed at the Ultimatrix. Break the rules, and I'll withhold the ultimate function for an extra week. I'll be good, Izuku promised quickly. And now I feel better, Inko said. Oh, Izuku, if you have any questions, I'm sure I could share some stories about your father and I when we first started dating. Actually, I still have some homework, so I'm going to get right on that, bye. Izuku grabbed his backpack and ran to his room, the laughter of Ben and his mother ringing in his ears. I hope Achako isn't going through something like this. A small part of Uraraka was wishing that she'd never met some of her friends. She didn't mean it in the slightest, but it would have saved her a lot of teasing. At least it was only on the chat that the girls had set up for themselves, but still. Crayon, I knew it. I knew you two would get together. Ha, huh? frog, I wish I'd bet some money, ribbit. Achako, you still owe me for buying you two some time. Book, it was very sweet of you. Sue you almost as sweet as that exchange between Achako and Izuku. Crayon, it was adorkable, and I love it. Comet, thanks. Would you three please get boyfriends so that I can tease you? Frog, all in good time, ribbit. Crayon, boyfriend. You two already making it official. Frog, honestly, if I didn't know better, I'd have thought you and Izuku had been together for a while. Book, crayon, comet, well, we like each other, okay. Can we at least have our date before going further? Crayon, how much further? P. Uraraka blushed and shut her phone off. Her hands went to her face in embarrassment, which immediately sent her floating through the air. She cancelled her quirk before she flew too high and landed with a thud on the floor. Ouch, she hissed and rubbed her sore knee. She'd done worse to herself whenever she accidentally made herself float, but she'd gotten much better at mitigating it after training at UA and with Gunhead. Her knee did little to distract her from her embarrassment. Earlier, when she called her parents to let them know that she was going on her first date, her father had thrown an exaggerated fit. He had gone on and on about how his little baby girl was all grown up, until her mother had finally wrestled the phone away from him. She had then asked her daughter if she needed a refresher on the talk. It had been asked with such sincerity that Achako hadn't been able to tell if she'd been teasing or not. At least my friends will stop messing with us after a few days, she muttered. I'm going to have to deal with mom and daddy forever. She paused. Wait, am I already calling us us? The week came and went in a blur for Midoriya. There were no villain attacks, no internships, and no logical deceptions from Aizawa, so by his standards, it had been a pretty boring week. There was only one noticeable change to his routine Uraraka. She hadn't exactly gotten clingy since they'd decided to date but she stayed a bit closer to him whenever they walked together. She also smiled at him more, of course, she usually smiled around him, but now there was just a little more to it. They had decided on something simple for their first date a simple dinner and a walk down the beach, specifically Dagaba Beach, which had briefly been on the news when it had been discovered that someone had cleaned it up in a single night. Midoriya and his friends knew the truth, and it had become like a shared joke between them whenever it was brought up. The only hiccup in the planning for the date was the method of transportation. Midoriya could get there fairly easily, but Uraraka needed to take a train. She had originally been fine with paying for a couple of extra tickets, but Midoriya had offered to give her a ride. You don't have a car, Uraraka had pointed out. You're right. Midoriya had tapped the Ultimatrix with one finger. I've got something better. Uraraka's eyes had gone wide. Deku-kun, you can't do that. We don't have licenses to use our quirks in public. Actually, the law specifically states that we can't use our quirks to disrupt public affairs, damage property, or injure someone outside of self-defense if the attacker uses a quirk first. He had replied, I can fly over the clouds and no one will notice. Uraraka had tried to argue against it, but he was technically right. They had even brought the matter up with Ida and Yeyurazu on the condition that they not speak about it to the others. They had agreed that Midoriya's plan skirted the edges of what was considered acceptable quirk use, but it was the kind of thing that was generally overlooked, unless someone caused a scene. Midoriya had promised that no scenes would be caused, which was enough for them. Which was why, on Friday night, Yuraraka was waiting outside her apartment for Midoriya to literally pick her up. It was exactly 6.30 when Jetre swooped in to land in front of her. H. Hey, Achako, he said nervously. Why you lookin' nice? Yuraraka nervously brushed some hair behind her ear. She hadn't really put extra effort into her appearance. A dress wasn't exactly suited to walking on the beach, after all. 
She was wearing a dark green tank top under a pink button-up shirt and a pair of white shorts. The only thing she'd added was a little makeup, something she'd only used a handful of times. Th thanks, Deku-kun. She looked at Jetray dubiously. Um, how are we getting to the restaurant? Can your arms carry me and fly? And no. Jetray turned and presented his back to him. Just hold on tight, really, or I can carry you with my feet. Without another word, Yuraraka hopped onto his back and wrapped her arms around his neck. Don't worry, we'll be there in less than a minute. Right, Ben? What am I? Your GPS. Ben grumbled from inside the Ultimatrix. Just don't hit any turbulence and you'll be fine. Iraraka most certainly did not squeak when Jetre took off into the sky, and she would send anyone who suggested otherwise into orbit. Thankfully, the terror was over almost as soon as it began, because Jetre pulled into land in an alley where he could transform without anyone seeing him. As sorry, Midoriya said. I didn't mean to scare you. He sounded so miserable that Yuraraka couldn't stay mad at him. Instead, she just rolled her eyes and looped her arm through his. It's fine, she promised. Come on, let's get some food. As she led Midoriya down the street, she took a moment to take in her date's appearance. He wore gray shorts that went just past his knees, and an open blue shirt over a white t-shirt. There were also his ever-present red shoes, which made Yuraraka wonder if he had ever worn shoes that weren't that color. What had her distracted were the muscles she could feel under his shirt. They weren't excessively bulky, like All Might, but the muscles of someone who regularly exercised and kept to a healthy lifestyle. After a moment's consideration, she decided that a bodybuilder wasn't to her taste anyway. You too, she said. Huh? You said I looked nice, she explained. So do you. Th thanks. Yuraraka tried not to laugh when she felt him shaking like a leaf. At least she was better at hiding how nervous she was. Hey, there's the restaurant. While Midoriya had suggested the walk on the beach a little cheesy, but it was sweet, and it was free, which appealed to both of them Yuraraka had been the one to find a place to eat. It wasn't quite a hole-in-the-wall kind of place, but it also wasn't somewhere that needed reservations, or a Yeyurazu-level budget. After finding a booth, the two started to look at the menu when things felt a little awkward. Both of them wanted to say something, but nothing felt right. Hey, Deku-kun. Yuraraka waited until she had his full attention before continuing. Are we trying too hard? What do you mean? I mean, yeah, we're on a date, but we're still friends. We don't have to act differently just because we, oh Yuraraka blushed. Be because we all like each other. Midoriya finished, and she nodded. Yeah, I think you're right. Like that, they relaxed, and started talking again. The only difference now was that they were willing to share things about themselves that they hadn't before. For instance, Midoriya was surprised to learn that Yuraraka was taking it upon herself to learn physics, even though they wouldn't have classes on the subject until their third year at UA. Part of it is because of my quirk, she admitted. A lot of how I want to use my quirk is learning how gravity applies to things, and then taking it out of the equation. I even sent a worksheet I completed to a physics professor in Tokyo. He was really confused why I deliberately chose the opposite of the answer, until I explained my quirk. She giggled at the memory. He said that he'd never met a reverse physicist before, but I might be the first. For his part, Midoriya let slip that he was actually pretty good at cooking, mostly out of necessity. It had started when he had gotten old enough to stay at home without supervision, and his mother could work again. No one wanted to babysit after they found out I was quirkless. Midoriya shrugged the old memory away, but Yuraraka allowed herself a moment of anger on his behalf. The nerve of those bigots. What about your dad? She asked. Wasn't he around to help? She wanted to slap herself for such an insensitive question. What if his father was dead or had gotten a divorce? She didn't want to go into something so personal, especially on their first date. He's overseas most of the time, Midoriya explained, not bothered in the slightest. He sets up meetings between companies, usually stuff that's too sensitive to be sent over email, and stays around to make sure that any deals hold firm. It's not that he doesn't want to be around, but he makes enough to keep our home and make sure we have enough money to live off of. Mom doesn't actually have to work, but she thought that if she made some money, Dad could come home more often. When was the last time you saw him? I video call him every few weeks. I think Mom talks to him a couple times a week, but it's only for a few minutes. Midoriya paused. If you mean in person, then it's been a little over two years. Yuraraka couldn't imagine going without seeing her parents for years on end. Just a couple of months had been heartbreaking. The two continued to talk until their food arrived. They had both ordered okonomiyaki, a type of savory pancake that was a little heavy on the calories. But considering how much they exercised, it wasn't that big a deal. After eating and paying for their meal Yuraraka insisted they split the bill when Midoriya offered to pay for all of it they headed back to the dark alley. 
one transformation later, and Jetray was taking them to Dagaba Beach. Wow, the news didn't do it justice, Uraraka said as they landed on the sand. This place is beautiful. Midoriya had to agree, the last time he had been here, there had been too much going on in his head to really appreciate just what Ken had done. The sand looked like silver dust in the moonlight, and the gentle waves were soothing to hear. They stood there in silence, watching the ocean, until Midoriya tentatively reached for Uraraka's hand. Their fingers laced together, though she made sure not to touch him with all five fingers. Hand in hand, they slowly walked to where the waves met the sand. Yeah, Uraraka whispered, this is nice. She had to keep running. She'd had enough and had to get away. She couldn't go back with the bad men again not to the needles and the pain and the darkness. But he was following her. She didn't know his name. But he would find her, just like all the others who found her when she ran away. But she had to try. And then she saw them. There were two of them, walking in the sand though she didn't know why people would do that. They were holding hands, and the girl was resting her head on the boy's shoulder. She didn't know either of them, but they had to be better than the bad men. And so, she made a decision, and turned. Midoriya wondered if there was any way he could freeze time. This moment was about as perfect as it could get. For a few blissful minutes, there was nothing but him, Uraraka, and the beach. And then something collided with him, sending him tumbling into the sand. Deku-kun, are you okay? At least Uraraka had kept her footing. But Midoriya was now trying to figure out just what the heck had hit him. It turned out to be a little girl. She couldn't have been more than five or six years old, with long pale gray hair and a small horn on the right side of her forehead though whether it was a minor mutant type quirk or just an element of something else, Midoriya didn't know. She wore a ragged dress and was barefoot. What alarmed him were the bandages around her arms and legs that set off alarms in the mind of a would-be hero. There was a little girl who was possibly hurt, clearly didn't have the best quality of life, and if her trembling was any indication, she was absolutely terrified. Hey, hey, he said gently and helped the girl to her feet. Are you okay? The girl opened her eyes, revealing red irises. P please help me. Uraraka knelt down so that she could look the girl in the eye. Of course, sweetie. Why don't we get out of this sand, okay? The girl must not have expected that kind of reaction because she looked bewildered. Uraraka gently guided her to the street, while Midoriya dusted himself off. Then, he muttered softly, so that the girl wouldn't hear, I need you. Ben who had remained off until Midoriya called for him didn't materialize, but he was immediately aware that something was wrong. What's up? The girl looks like she was in trouble. Can you call the police through my phone if we need to? You got it, buddy, but we've got incoming. Keep your guard up. Sure enough, a man was walking quickly down the street. When he saw them, he increased his speed to just under a jog. He was easily six feet tall, with shaggy hair that almost looked like a lion's mane. His clothes had once been very nice, but looked like they'd been worn a few too many times. Eerie, there you are, the man chided in a gruff voice that tried to sound sweet and failed miserably. Come on, you know better than to wander off. He looked at the teenagers and smiled. It looked more like a sneer and did nothing to ease their nerves. Sorry about that. Kids, Iri likes to run off sometimes, but she needs to go home now. The girl, Iri, whimpered and hid behind Uraraka. Sorry, she seems a little freaked out right now, Midoriya said, thinking quickly. She fell down, and she might have gotten sand under her bandages. Can we have a minute to clean her up? The man shifted in place uneasily. Fine, hurry up, my boss wants her back pronto. Midoriya decided to take a big risk and turned his back on the man as he knelt in front of Iri. He had to trust that Uraraka would watch out for him. Are you hurt? He whispered as he pretended to inspect Iri's bandages. No. Somehow, Iri realized that she had to be quiet. He's a bad man. He'll hurt you. We'll try to avoid that, Midoriya said as he brushed some sand out of her hair and then stood up to face the man. Sorry, it looks like she hurt her leg. We should get her to a doctor. No need, my boss is a doctor. The man gave Iri a hard stare. He'll fix you right up, won't he, Iri? Every passing second sent up more red flags. Iri was clearly terrified, and now this man was trying to keep her away from any sort of authority. Were they dealing with a kidnapper and his victim? Excuse me, sir. Uraraka was the picture of naive innocence as she spoke. Are you this girl's father? The man sneered. Do I look like her dad? Look, I'm being nice, but this is your last chance give me the girl, and no one gets hurt. The innocent look melted away, leaving only fierce determination. Funny, I was going to give you the same warning. With a growl, the man pulled a knife from inside his coat and lunged. Uraraka reacted with apparent ease she grabbed his wrist, twisted it to make him drop the knife, and used his momentum to knock him down. 
This was all they could legally do. Without licenses, they couldn't use their quirks unless their attacker did so first. Midoriya scooped up Iri and backpedaled several paces. One of them had to keep the girl safe, so he had to trust that Uraraka could handle it. The police have been called, Ben said, his voice tense. They'll be here in five minutes. Bad move, little girl, the man spat as he stood back up. I'm gonna beat you bloody for that. Even to Midoriya's less experienced eye, the man was no trained fighter. His punches were wide and obvious, and his footing was terrible. Uraraka danced around each swing, striking at openings with her knees and the heel of her palm. Individually, the blows weren't too damaging, but they added up, and the thug was rapidly running out of steam. Oh, screw this. The man roared, his mouth opening far wider than it should have been able to. His teeth grew into large fangs, and tan fur sprouted over his skin. Now, he really did look like a lion. Any last words, before I rip you to pieces? He asked, holding out his claw-tipped hands for emphasis. To her credit, Uraraka only raised an eyebrow. Now, bad kitty. Midoriya couldn't help but wince as Uraraka stepped in close and drove her knee between her attacker's legs. One of the man's paws went down to cover his groin while the other flailed out towards her. Apparently, his transformation made him faster, because Uraraka couldn't avoid his claws as easily as before. One of them raked across her left arm, and she cried out in pain. That was enough for Midoriya. A quirk had been used also. Much more importantly, the son of a bitch had hurt Uraraka. This was going to end now. Uraraka had barely registered the searing pain in her arm when she saw a flash of green light in the corner of her eye. The next thing she knew, a full-sized human gausser brought a huge fist down on the lion man. There was a gasp, and possibly a crack of something breaking, and when the fist pulled back, the thug was back in his human form, unconscious and probably in need of a hospital. There was another flash of green light, and then Midoriya was running up to her. Are you okay? Uraraka looked at her arm, the cut was long, but shallow. I don't think it's too bad. Midoriya nodded, and then hugged her fiercely. Good, I was. Uraraka just hugged him back with her uninjured arm. I'm okay, we're both okay. She looked back and saw Iri, staring at the unconscious man with wide, disbelieving eyes. And I think she's okay, too. Midoriya nodded again, and then pulled off his outer shirt to wrap around her arm. That should hold until we can get you to a doctor. Thanks, Deku-kun. Uraraka looked at the makeshift bandage that was quickly becoming stained with red. Sorry about your shirt. I'd rather lose the shirt than you, he replied, as the sound of approaching sirens was heard. Uraraka would later blame her blush on adrenaline. With a potential kidnapping victim and Uraraka's injury to consider, the police brought them to the hospital first. Iri refused to be parted from her rescuers, holding on to Midoriya's hand the entire time, save for when he had to go to the bathroom or was speaking privately to the police. When he came back, he found her hanging on to Uraraka. It would have been sweet had the poor girl not looked so terrified. The police quickly identified their attacker as a low-level Yakuza thug, who was wanted for several quirk-related assaults. Considering that, and how the students had only acted in self-defense, the police barely gave them a slap on the wrist, and only because they were required to do so by law. Your school will be informed, an officer said but we'll keep your names out of the media, just in case that punk's bosses want revenge. Thank you, Midoriya said. What about Iri? The girl. The officer looked over at Iri, who had all but fainted from stress. She was asleep on a chair, and rested her head on Uraraka's lap. Unfortunately, she doesn't match the description of any missing persons. We also ran her fingerprints, but she's not in any system. Whoever had her didn't want anyone to know about her. Midoriya felt pity stab into him. Then what's going to happen to her? I don't know, the officer admitted. Putting her in the foster system might be a bad idea, especially if her captors want her back. Plus, she's pretty traumatized. That was an understatement. When the doctors had tried to take a blood sample, Iri had taken one look at the needle, screamed, and tried to get away. Only the combined efforts of Midoriya and Uraraka had calmed her down. And even then, the latter had to let the doctors take blood from her first, before Iri let them do the same to her. She also refused to let anyone but Uraraka and Midoriya change her bandages. That was when they saw the deep scars going up her arms and legs. It was obvious that Iri had been emotionally and physically scarred by a barbaric perversion of medical practice. Something about Iri's circumstances was oddly familiar to Midoriya, and he almost hit himself for not realizing it sooner. Um, can I make a call? He asked. I think I know someone who might be able to help. The police officer shrugged. You can ask them, but they'll have to contact us before any decision is made. I understand. Midoriya hastily excused himself and went out into the hallway before dialing a certain number on his phone. It only rang once before it was picked up. 
Midoriya san. This is an unexpected surprise. Is something the matter? Hello, Nezu sensei, Midoriya said. I need your help. Yuraka tilted her head as Midoriya returned a few minutes later. What was that about? I called Nezu sensei to see if Yue could take protective custody over Iri, he explained. It's the safest place I could think of. That could work. Yuraka looked down at the sleeping girl in her lap and gently stroked her hair. What did Nezu sensei say? He said he'd talk to the police about it. We'll find out more later. Midoriya pulled up a chair so that he sat in front of her. Are you okay? Yuraka looked down at her bandaged arm. I'll be fine. If I go to recovery girl, I probably won't even have a scar. Midoriya sighed and leaned forward to put his head in his hands. Thank goodness. Thank Gunhead. He's the one who showed me how to fight. She reached out and tilted his head up to look at her. This isn't what I was expecting for a first date. He flinched. I'm sorry. Don't be. We helped someone who needed us, Izuku. She smiled. Besides, the next one can only be better, right? Yeah, I guess wait. Midoriya blinked. You w want to go out on another date. Yuraka wondered how to articulate just what she wanted to say. Nothing she could think of seemed to work. Screw it, direct approach. She pulled him in close and kissed him. This wasn't a peck on the cheek, but a real kiss that Yuraka hoped would convey just what she was feeling. At first, Midoriya froze, then to her surprise and delight, he leaned in and kissed her back. It was a little clumsy neither of them had any experience with this sort of thing but it felt right. They pulled back after several seconds, both grinning. So are you my girlfriend? Yuraka gave her best teasing smirk. Nah, you're my boyfriend. Midoriya nodded. I'm okay with that. Odd they looked down and saw Iri staring at them with wide eyes. What are you doing with your faces? When a nurse came in to check on them, it was to the sight of the two teenagers blushing and sputtering. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 7. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.